The others are all gone. Off on their mundane errands. Seeking solace in their companionships. <coughs> their hopes. Their loves. <laughs> they not see how it will all end. How all crumbles. All is undone. And yet, I have been happy. Strange. <coughs> there have not been many times in my life I could make that claim. Certainly not when I was young. Nor in these past few years. After they tortured my body and cursed me with these eyes. But then, I never expected happiness. <coughs> How paltry it is compared to my magic. I will have all the time required. I must discover the secrets of this dragon orb. Relax. <laughs> I must relax. I do not fear. I am strong. Look at what I have done. Look at the power I have attained. <coughs> Witness what I did in Darkened Wood. Witness what I did in Sylvan Esti. I am strong. <coughs> I do not fear. Must be luck, my paralan, sa akvlar. Tantangusar. Yes. <laughs> I like clothes within the orb. Ost bilak moi baralan. Sak flar. Tantangusar. Hence, two hands emerge from the orb. Uh, maintain control. I will not let you take what is rightfully mine from me. What are you? Are you good? Evil? I am neither. I am nothing. I am everything. The essence of dragons captured long ago is what I am. How do you work? How do you control the dragons? At your command, I will call them to me. They cannot resist my call. They will obey. Will they turn upon their masters? Will they fall under my command? That depends on the strength of the masters and the bond between the two. I must study this. I... I do not understand. Be easy. I will aid you. Now that we have joined, you may seek my help often. I know many secrets long forgotten. What secrets? Relax. I will not let you fall. Sleep, for you are weary. Tell me. I must know. This only I will tell you. Then you must rest. In the library of Astinus of Parathas are books. Hundreds of books. Taken there by the mages of old in the days of the lost battle. To all who look at these books, they seem nothing more than encyclopedias of magic. Dull histories of mages who died in the caverns of time. The darkness, it, it creeps towards me. No, no. Tell me, what do the books really contain? There. Now you understand. Pre-recorded in a second floor guest room filled with tall ales and taller tales. Join a group of grown men intent on discussing the intricacies of fantasy and science fiction. Tim Gilbert Media presents... Dungeons and Weeds! <laughs> Traveling.
Wrestling, Half Elven, Strip Magic. This is the Dungeons and Dweebs Podcast, Episode 4, Dragons of Winter Night, Part 2. We're not hiding our true identity from you. We really are a group of post-pubescent man-children seeking fame and glory. I'm your host, Bob. Don't call me P, or I'll show you my hair-encrusted chest, Jim. Bally fool, never mind the fourth. But I'm not alone. Across the table from me, the man who holds his dragon orbs and slings of only the finest gnome construction, Luke. We are back at it again here with our second part of book Wait, books two and three of volume two, Dragonlance Chronicles, uh, Dragons of Winter Night. Hey, Luke, <sighs> it's a Dungeons and Dragons thing. I don't even. <laughs> 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 but hey, let's not waste too much time here. To my left, he's the Hasselhoff to my Tasselhoff, Klob. Hello again, it's Klob, your man in the stands whose attitude right now may start to make Flint's look like more of a kinder youngling. I do believe that after the week I've had tonight, I may just enter my Adam Warlock-like cocoon and not come out until Christmas. Across the table for me is the man who can't fathom a plan, a young boy who has, has that genetic disorder where he can't feel his pain receptors. The Logan to my Charles, Paul. How are you, my young friend? How's oh, things in your neck of the woods? It's going good. It's going real good. And you know what? I've come up with a plan. My plan is to not have a plan. It's been working great for me so far. Ooh. Beautiful. <laughs> I know. Man, well, here we are, episode four, preparing to wrap up the second of the Dragonlance Chronicles books, Dragons of Winter Nights. Wow, I can't believe we're finally here. It's Yeah, it's been a bit of a journey. Um, you know, I don't really want to spoil where, where my feelings are right now, but... We've been on a journey. It definitely is. This, for some reason, it feels like this this journey took a little longer than the first book. I don't know what what it was, but this one this one seems like it extended a little bit. Right, and again, we'd called it out in the first uh, in our our first part uh, of Dragons of Winter Night that this was the darker chapter uh, of the book. So, uh, man, I was excited to see part two. How dark are things going to get? The Empire Strikes Back of the Dragonlance Chronicles. Oh, dun, dun, man. Yeah. yeah. Who's going to get put in carbonite? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I've got a couple ideas. <laughs> Who we could put into carbonite? Okay, we can't put half the party in carbonite. I'm sorry. W- wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be great, though? It kind of feels like they're in carbonite anyways because they just keep popping up randomly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where have you been? Whoa, I was in the wagon. What? what? Isn't there a dragon that breathes carbonite? I mean, That's, do we have that? Yes. Is that a thing? Yes. So that's, actually, that's actually a gray dragon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a D&D thing. It's a D&D, <laughs> it's a D&D thing. Uh, nice. All right, guys. Before we kick off into ep- episode four proper, let's grab a couple drinks and uh, gather up around the fire. Hey, I can go for that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, all right. Hey. Hey. So, another another round. So. I was in a relationship oh, you, with man. the dra- woman, woman with the blue voice. dragon. She brought me up to her room. Boy, did she have good Where's time. my corn purse? Why don't you fellas follow me to my couch? I'll show you how my glory is good. What'll it be, boys? Tavern talk. All right, so now that we've grabbed our drinks, settled back down by the fire, Paul, what's new in your world? You know, a game recently came out. Uh, it's Destiny 2. I haven't played many video games for a little while, but that one caught my attention. So I just said, you know what? I'm going to get it. I started playing it. I'm really loving it so far. It's been fun. Graphics seem good. Gameplay seems really fun. I don't know. It's it's nice. It seems like a game that I can put down for a week, come back, maybe play for half an hour, hour, and go. Now that I'm a little older, it's it's hard to it's harder to put in time for video games. I don't want to commit a bunch of time for it. I just kind of want to go slow. Destiny like, Two. Now, what is like what I have not heard of this. What what is the world? What is this? Uh, the world is pretty much ending. So a bunch of things are coming and attacking the world. What's to it, my it's knowledge, Earth. Earth. it is Earth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to be very honest, I don't know the backstory very well. I just saw some of the gameplay, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know a big orb. I'm forgetting what its name is called. The Traveler. The Traveler. Thank you. <laughs> I, I played the first one. Yeah, you played the, you played the first one. Cyan uh, Orbbane. There you go. <laughs> I was wondering if maybe, you know, the destruction was coming from the two, you know, deities of Harvey and Irma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you're more of a uh, story mode player on there, right? Absolutely. I'm not a big multiplayer game uh Person, I prefer store single player mainly because then I can go at my own pace. I can kind of right. wander around. I'll join in some fire teams, run around, 
and do that. But I generally don't mm-hmm. talk in them. I, it's, I'm just there to play, calm down a little bit after work, relax. Mm-hmm. I don't want to, I don't know, talk to a bunch of people right. that I have no idea who they are. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you, Paul. Whenever I game, which is once every so often when the moons align just correctly. <laughs> Whenever uh, you can get on that Atari server. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Atari can't go online, I guess. But I, I prefer to game alone as well. I don't yeah, care about social. Anyways, yeah, the beginning of that story seemed really good. Um, I, I mean, I... Are you talking about the game or Paul? Uh, yeah, the beginning of Paul. You look back. <laughs> hey, I'm always interesting. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, it, it, looked, it looked really good. I like the... Um, it seemed really intense. Yeah, it Really it, fun. Yeah. Um, I didn't play much of the story the first one. I bought it when it when the game and all the expansions were thirty five dollars on Amazon. Played for about a week with some friends and I had, I had some fun with it. But you know, I don't know. It just didn't really grab me enough to jump on board on day of release. Yeah, I was. I yeah. honestly surprised myself by jumping on. To be very honest, I'm not, I'm not one who will at yeah you're on day of not. release go in and buy it. But it was one of those where I was like, well. I've been wanting to play a first-person shooter. I've been wanting to have a little bit of something to sit down and not think. You know, with reading these books, I'm enjoying them, but I have to think when I'm reading them. I want to just sit down, play a game for half an hour, hour, leave. And I can do that with Destiny. Right. Uh, Cloud, what about you? What have you been up to? Um, actually, I've been doing a little bit of gaming myself as well. I've kind of gone a di- I know. That, that I've kind of got a. Us. I've kind of got a different direction. <laughs> Uh, I'm a deer hunter. We're coming up on the fall when deer season goes through, so I've been playing a lot of Cabela's Deer Hunter and <laughs> uh, the, the different uh, deer hunting games. Is just it popped into my head the other the other day earlier this week. I'm like, I haven't played these in a while, and so rediscovering it. It's just kind of fun because you can, you don't have to deal with multiplayer. You don't have to deal with anything else. You can just go through. And I'm actually playing um, Deer Hunter 2017 right now on the iPad, which is, <laughs> which is actually a really good time because um, it's a little bit portable. I finished Dragons of the Dwarven Depths for my reading. That, that middle chronicle between autumn and between winter here. I'm telling you guys, read it. It answers a whole bunch of questions. I'm going to try again as we go through here to not spoil it too much, but I'm going to bring up a bunch of times when we get into this later about, hey, that's answered in this book over here. Uh, I've been, I mentioned before, Bob and I mentioned before that we have kids. I have a 10-year-old. And one of the things I will have to say that I've been really geeking out on lately is Lego has these like 10 inch build your own action figures of all the characters. Oh, I have seen those. And yep. they, I like them. my 10 year old and I have just gone geek on them and we keep, we keep buying them because they're only like 10, 15, 20 bucks a pop and we keep right. buying them and they're just, it's a great time and you can build your own action figure. Right. Um, kind of the other media stuff I just did, I did finally sit down and I watched uh, the Guy Ritchie King Arthur movie, King Arthur, Le- King Arthur Legend of the Sword. Oh, you know, I saw that. Okay, so what is your review of that movie? My review of that movie is worth the watch, mm-hmm. but don't expect too much. Okay. I like Guy Ritchie movies. I like that. I, I do like a bit of the fast cut action Right. I wish they would have explained more. There's a bunch. They they do start to sci-fi it up a bit, mm. and they do fantasy it up a little bit with a little magic and a little other things. But I they never explain anything. Right. That was like my one cut down. You watch it as an action movie with like a little bit of the King Arthur mythos thrown in. Yeah. I thought it was pretty good. Definitely worth the watch. Worth the dollar at Red or worth the two dollars for the Blu-ray at Redbox. I probably won't buy it. I'll, I'll have to check it out because yeah, what when I saw kind of the previews for it, the thing that got me right away was kind of the the costume design choices and, and things like that. It didn't look to me medieval or that's Guy Ritchie. Yeah, you know, he does, <laughs> and that, he, does and, he does what he wants. Yeah, right. And I'm like, where's that Scalibur look? <laughs> well, and I'm a big I'm a big fan of Jude Law and mm-hmm. Charlie Hunan. Charlie Hunan is the play, is the guy who plays Arthur in it. Um, he's also the lead guy from Sons of Anarchy. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, was, oh, so that yeah, I, was, I know what you're talking about now. It was I weird to hear him talk in his because he's actually English. Yeah, really? yeah. So I, it was, that blew me away. It yeah. was weird to hear him talk in his natural voice, but it, it, it actually fit in, and it did, it did very well. Luke, what have you been up to this week? Well, since we, you know, finished uh, reading Dragons Winter Night, my my little ritual I like to do after I'm done is binge Netflix. <laughs> 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 and uh, actually, something that came out that I've been looking forward to for such a long time was The Defenders. Right. Um, and actually, I, I'll, I'll preface this a little bit, um, and this will be spoiler free. Don't worry. Um, I w- I'm a huge fan of Jessica Jones and um, Luke Cage. Mm-hmm. Huge fans. I love those series. 
Iron Fist, I didn't grab me at all. I didn't watch that series. Daredevil, I tried to watch, and I I don't like Daredevil. I don't like yeah. that hero. I don't yeah. like what he does. Oh. This this is going I, to be heresy, but I agree with you, Luke. Yeah. I, 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 and I, I was those, expecting some hate over this. Uh, yeah, because Daredevil has never, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's the costume. I, I, I like don't the know, actor. I don't know what it is. He's never sunk with me. I'm actually in your guys' camp. Oh, I, wow. I, I, Whoa. Oh, I'm the lower crabby I'm man. Because <laughs> I just, I don't know, uh, the, the TV show, I just couldn't get into it. I'd watch yeah. two episodes and love those two episodes, and then I just would go, okay, I don't care anymore. Mm. And see, the thing is with Daredevil is Daredevil was meant to be so, was meant to be so dark. Mm -hmm. Daredevil was part of that Marvel response to the campy Batman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because Batman, you know, all of a sudden we have, you know, the Batman that is, you know, so campy in the bang, whiz, pow. <laughs> and Darede Daredevil was, I was partially meant to go in there. I always liked, we talked uh, on the last episode about how some of the superhero stuff needs to go back to that small world rather than the end of the universe. That's one of the reasons yeah. I love the Daredevil. Sure. And I'm not just talking about the series. I love the Daredevil comics, the old school Daredevil comics, because they were so dark. Mm -hmm. He was he was the, he was was the one of the first anti-heroes. He was one of the first guys who made decisions that you looked at and went, well, you know, Reed Richards or Superman is not going to make that decision because they're too good a person, but right. Daredevil will mess people up. Did you think the Netflix Daredevil series did that? Much better than previous things. I'm really? hearing people who are Daredevil fans. Yeah, they don't love it. the Netflix series. You know, I well, don't you gotta know. remember what we got with uh with with uh oh, Affleck. With, with Aff Devil. Uh, Aff Aff Devil, Devil yes. it, it could be that <laughs> yes. that movie came out and just totally tainted uh, Daredevil uh for me. But you know, I think sometimes I, that it could be the look of Daredevil for me. I'm not yeah. gonna discount the fact that for me, like you said, they're pushing against Batman, but even Campy Okay, I'm, I'm going to take away the really old-looking Batman. Yeah. But Batman kind of has a cool look to him, and Daredevil seems to be the slightly lesser version. They like just kind of he kind of has bad ears, but they're short, <laughs> like yeah. the little devil horns. <laughs> the little devil horns. horns. I know, but they, there's something about him that I kind of giggle. Like he comes on the stage, like I'm Daredevil, and I don't care how dark. Like he could rip a guy's heart out of his chest, <laughs> and I kind of <laughs> snicker. I'd be like <laughs> Daredevil. I, <laughs> I, okay, at, at some point, at oh. some point, I will tell you when you know. Time comes around when we're eighty. Yeah, hey, go man. back, go back and read the actual Daredevil comics. Yeah, I, I think okay. I need to. Do and I'll that. tell you what got me into the Daredevil comics um, when I was younger was we talk a lot about um, Bill Bixby and yeah. the Incredible Hulk. Yes, mm -hmm. there's the '80s oh, Bill Bixby please. movie with the cheesy Daredevil. <laughs> oh my god! That, I, that I, I watched it again though. I watched it again recently. I remember loving it as a mm -hmm. kid. I watched it again and went. Okay, it's Bill Bixby. I'll get behind right. that. But that's actually what got me into you, Daredevil. You know what? For those people who are now hating that the the fact that we all don't like Daredevil, don't say we all. Not don't we say all, we all. Not actually. Yeah. Bob loves Daredevil, but I think that could be it. Is that is the first Daredevil I saw? Was that you know iteration of him from the it, Bill it was Bixby the TV, stuff? It was the TV movie Daredevil. It was pretty horrible. Uh, and, but and remember that was after the TV movie Thor. Yeah. Ooh. There will be people who are like, okay, Bob, uh, now we're just totally not with you about anything anymore. But stuff with Thor, uh, I can go with that storyline of a like a out of place, out of time barbarian who comes to a future and and is just like, I don't know what's going on. And I don't care what I don't care that he's wearing a weird furry loincloth. I can watch that again and again and love it in all of its iterations. I, I don't know why. That's your obsession with Conan. I think Conan it's my Conan barbarian. thing. Yeah, I, I do agree. I do agree. It's the fact that. That you are currently wearing Mjolnir around your neck. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, I know this is kind of like spiral off the rails here. Yeah. But I mean, I like, and I should know better not to bring up Marvel around you guys. But <laughs> the Defenders, it was I. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Daredevil was my least favorite part, and I'll just my little comment on that. He he doesn't come off dark. He comes off whiny to me. Um, I actually I ended up liking the Iron Fist, and I actually I might go back and watch the Iron Fist because of this. Um, but really what, what, what draws me to this, um, I do, Claude, what you brought up, the, the badass, and that's Jessica Jones for me. There's something about a dark-haired girl who can kick butt that just, I, I love it. I, I, I don't, there's, there's, they're doing, uh, some good service to, like, the female anti-hero, which I don't really know that there is much, aside from Harley Quinn and that terrible, uh, 
just not Justice League, opposite of Justice League. What's that? Suicide Squad. Suicide, Suicide Squad. Squad. There we go. Yeah. What are you um, What are you talking about, Putin? A lot. Putin. A lot of time, I think they're too yeah. over the top, and I think she's uh, kind of more believable. Yeah. And yeah. buy into her, her one liners in there are fantastic. There's a point. Um, Whenever like somebody new encounters the Iron Fist, he's like, "I am the immortal Iron Fist," and she just stands there, stands there, and goes, "What are you on lithium?" <laughs> like, <laughs> just like, "Come on, man." Right. Um, there's a uh, everybody she's fighting with knows karate, and they're just like kicking everybody's butt, everybody's butt. She's st- st- standing there in a the parking lot, like, "Okay, everybody knows karate now, I guess, except for me." And then she just punches somebody, and they fly twenty feet. <laughs> um, one of my favorite heroes ever. Uh, but that's kind of been that's been my little uh, nerd fest lately. Um, I will, no spoilers, but the ending was stupid. Come on. If it would have just ended, I, I say this about a lot of stuff, if it would have just ended it 15 minutes sooner, I'm fine. Anyway, if I don't know. If you agree with let's talk on the internet about it, if you guys agree with me or not. Uh, I'll pass it over to Bob. Okay, I'm going to try to keep this one quick because we've got a lot to get to today. But and I don't want to keep this mainstream, but uh, I have not had a lot of time for a lot of things. A lot of Dragonlance still reading stuff like that. I got some of the comics, so I was reading through those. Um, but uh, I was able to watch, finally, because I didn't go to theaters to watch it, but Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Ooh. And, uh, boy, I really liked it. I Again, I said on a previous podcast, I didn't know that Guardians of the Galaxy was going to hook me uh, like it did, but that first one was just such a fun romp. And then this one, I mean, if we want to talk about what's an Empire Strikes Back, I think this second one is definitely a darker take on the Guardians. I think it definitely fleshes out the uh, the characters. In, uh, I, mean, I did not think I was going to feel the feels for Yondu. Uh, right, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mary Poppins, y'all. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, man. Oh, yeah. Tug on my heartstrings hard. Yeah. I mean, th- again, uh, they are just hitting all the right notes, I feel, with this series. I mean, I really only have one critique, and that is I do believe it's too long. There was there was parts where I'm like, okay, in this final kind of fight and things that happened, we mm-hmm. could probably kind of cut some things and make it more concise. But, man, it was firing on all cylinders for me. I had a really good time. Yeah, definitely. One. And. And from so, again, from somebody who's I'm the count old comics guy. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the stuff that they did was the shout outs to the original Guardians. Oh I god, mean, yeah. The, the original Gar the original Yondu was a member of the original Guardians yes, before right. this at this uh iteration. Stallone Stallone and, what, and his crew were like a representation of, her of the original that, that that was at the end of volume two. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, I was just yeah. I was just gonna bring that up. Yeah. It, who was oh Miley Cyrus was one of them. Yes, she was uh yeah. she, yes. She, no, little, what? She was the robot. I did that. She was the robot. She was the robot head in the background. Yeah. I mean, I, I wait, 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 wait. <laughs> that's an Easter egg. <laughs> well, so I mean, <laughs> I don't know how I, I feel about. Yeah, now, wait, 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 wait. Now I don't know how I feel about Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, okay. okay. Like that. You're, 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 you have destroyed. Wait till, you, wait till you get to the Bieber eggs. Yeah. Let me bring this all around. That's an Easter egg that you find in June. Oh, oh, what is, oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Justin Bieber's in volume three. God, oh, why did you tell me that? He's not, he's not. That's not a thing. Can I, just, can, I, can, I, thing. can I just say, can I just say, can I just say too, that I, I'll fully admit that I kind of completely have a man crush on Kurt Russell. Yeah, yeah. And Kurt Ru- from, you know, going back, you know, you look at the aspect of, from what he's done from Big Trouble in Little China. Oh, yeah. Love that movie. All the way to now Ego. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, I want your life. Can I just say, <laughs> the de-aging effect that they did on Beautiful. him was perfect. I mean, Tron, I, I was okay with Tron because I'm kind of a Tron fan. And, you know, there's issues there. But I didn't feel the de-aging that they did in Tron Legacy, which they really mm-hmm. kind of pushed for as being like, boy, did we do a great job with this. Eh, I, I still knew it was yeah. de-aging. I've what? watched that like five times. I cannot tell uh-huh. that that is CG. I know he says it's like 90% makeup. I don't believe him. I believe it's a lot of CGI. Yeah. He's just trying uh, to make himself feel better. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> but man, did they do a good job yeah. with that. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Well, hey, I could use another round. Luke, yeah, could you use another round? I, I could, yeah. And hey, we got a lot of book to cover here. We should really wrap this up. Right. Grab another round. Tackle Dragons of Winter Night. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Sounds good. Woo! Come on. Hey, can I get some uh, Bell's Dragon Hearted Ale? Ooh, <laughs> tell me more. It's, a, it's a DeLorean, isn't it? Scales, <laughs> you're always in my face. I might have driven a DeLorean here. I pull up a chair, friend. 
All right. So before we get to actually reviewing the book, hey, we have feedback. Well, hey, we asked for it. We asked for it, <laughs> and we got some of it. All and right. don't get us wrong. Thank you very much for all your feedback. Oh, you no, guys we, have been great. At, we've we, we've gotten some love. We've gotten some hate. We've gotten some weird things in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that was for me. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Did you put it on? <laughs> I'm wearing it right now. <laughs> all right. Oh. So um, our first uh, Brendan on Facebook. Facebook says, uh, wait, wait, why does Klob want to get rid of Lorana? So, Klob, I know you don't like Lorana. You usually call her Loriana or, or, <laughs> or, or Lorna. So we know we don't like you don't like her, but okay, what's your deal with Lorana? It, it's not so much a deal with Lorana. It just is I always have a spot. I have a soft spot for the bad girl. When we talked about Tavern Talk earlier, Luke was talking about he was always with his Jessica J Jones thing. There's always something about the dark haired, powerful woman. I am a Kit fan. I, Kit is more attractive to me. Even through this book, even through reading all three books, Kit is more attractive to me than Lorana. It's right, just an okay. aspect of. I'll, I'll go with the bad girl over the princess any day. Right, and I think those wow, are kind okay, of archetypes yeah, yeah. that are set up. You know, what are you attracted to? Kind of, you know, the, yeah, the princessy kind, good girl, or kind of the bad girl, you know, kind of a sexual deviant. <laughs> Maybe that kitty Yara is. Hey, Brendan goes on, though. Uh, he says, as for why Lorana's love story seems so much better written than Tannis's, I think it's because Lorana knows what she wants. So she comes across as passionate and decisive. Qualities most readers would like and appreciate. By contrast, Tennis's incessant ping-ponging between Lorana and Kidiara makes him come across as a wishy-washy wimp. I, I, I definitely agree. Like even like maybe like I was just like subconsciously putting those things together when I was, you know, making that comparison. Um, it's you, you nailed it right on the head, man. Uh, right. It, it's. Tannis feeling whiny. I mean, that's that's why I came out with you know emo Tannis. I it, he mm -hmm. definitely he's at this part in the story he just he doesn't know what he wants. And you know what, man, I just want you guys to save the world. I don't want to. I don't care about your <laughs> like oh too many women love me problem. Right. Like come on. You know you know you know I'm thinking it's 1984 of uh, 85 when this came out. I, I'm really thinking that yeah I agree with this. They should have really watched Highlander. <laughs> Well, actually, actually, to get a bead on on what love stories for somebody who's super old and has been through a lot should be like, because I always thought that Highlander, especially the TV series, got a lot of those notes right, and I agree. Yeah. Tannis does not come across as a as an over a hundred no, uh, half elf. No, no, he comes across as somebody who's twenty Honestly, and just doesn't know what's going I on. I forgot he was that old. Now that you mention it, it yeah, it, it makes it even worse. This should yeah. be Duncan McLeod. Notice Duncan. I didn't say Connor, <laughs> but it should be Duncan. Don't knock Connor. Just I forget like everything <laughs> after the first. Uh, I like the forget first. Forget everything movie. after, yeah. after oh, the first. Movie. I agree. Two never happened. But we'll maybe get there. Some did All they right. ever novelize Highlander? We'll do it on. Dungeons oh yes, oh, yes they did. Okay. Oh yes, they did. <laughs> All right, we're doing. All right, so Steve from Facebook says, "Hey, I like Tavern Talk. Short, sweet. I like that. He likes Tavern Talk. We I like, like Steve. Tavern Talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Steve, awesome. we like you for liking Tavern Steve, Talk. Steve, you're welcome to pull up a chair anytime, buddy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We've got one sitting right here for you." All right, so another Steve, not the same Steve, uh, says, I remember enjoying these books, but I only read book one of the Meetings Quintet after I read the Chronicles trilogy. I wish I had continued with Dragonlance. Oh. So I know there's two of us on the table who have kind of continued with Dragonlance, and we have read kind of beyond. I see, yeah, can you put that into context? What What is he talking about? So I think what he's saying is that he had read the Chronicles trilogy, which we're reading, yep. and then he had only read the first book of something called the Meetings Quintet, which are a bunch of books that take place before the Chronicles okay. and okay. kind of talk about what they were doing when they were kind of off on their five-year mission yeah. to explore new life and strange two galaxies. Uh, <laughs> and, um, You're not selling it. Yeah, and he only read book one of, of those, and he kind of wishes that he'd continued with it. Um, you know, I've, I've read through Legends, and I've, I've said this a million times now, and actually just this morning I was sitting on the couch um, reading The Heart of Gold Moon, which is a, a short story. Oh, are you uh, feeling okay? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah. Well, it was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 does somebody take it out at the end? Like, yeah, Temple of Doom? Yeah, well, you know you know how much I've loved Gold Moon and Riverwind, and it's just all about how they got together, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's there. But I, I do have to say, these the books, uh, look into, if, if Steve wants to look at other things and wants 
I mean, Legends, of course, I would recommend. That is actually, uh, yeah, we got some friends on uh, Twitter, PB Publishing. Uh, they, that is one that they highly recommend. Yeah, I, I think that, and this will come in our end recommendations, but mm-hmm. yeah, Legends are definitely something that you should look into. Go on to that. And actually, I like these tales, like the tales uh, and, and different compilations of many authors writing small little 20-page vignettes. I love them because some of them are great. Some of them are horrible, but it doesn't matter because they're 10 to 20 pages. You can be like, wow, that was awesome. And then the next one's horrible. You're through it really quick. And I'm really having a lot of fun reading those. So we got Andrew on Facebook who says, I'll listen to the first one on Subway tomorrow. Okay? I I love you, Andrew. This one one made me nervous because I saw when he posted that. (laughs) Yeah. And then he didn't post back for a while. I'm like... Did he hate it that bad? Did he hate it that bad? And then he comes back, and I, same with you, I was reading this, and he says, these guys are super critical, and I like it. So I'm, I'm feeling okay. They did a good job. I don't agree with a lot of it, but I see their points. It's nice to see non-Dragonlance people dive in. It's very easy to judge the book based on all the next books. A few times I felt tempted to be like, these friends don't know Poop about poop. <laughs> but, <laughs> nice editing. Nice editing. <laughs> We're a family-friendly show. <laughs> yes, but I think that my temptation to jump to the defense of my memories... Uh, oh, sorry, but I think that was a, a temptation to jump to the defense of my memories. I'm thinking about taking the dragon orb out, however. So, um, don't take out the dragon orb, Andrew. I hope after listening to the to our last episode. Uh, I know I tend to be super critical uh, on these books. Um, and again, I'm coming at it uh, older and not having, you know, all the history. All of us are. All of well, us. Yeah. All of I us think I'm the only one here that, co- that tries to go in reading these books as a kid. I try to put myself mm. back in that kid mindset, which is possibly why my reviews have been pretty good as, as a kid. Mm-hmm. I know for a fact I would have loved the first book. Right. Definitely, definitely. Now, Bob, one other thing we have here, and one of the things that I have on my screen is we did get a special me- message out there. Danny, if you're listening, buddy, we know that you've uh, lost contact with your dragon arms temporarily, and someday you may be able to find them. And we're, we're, we're praying and we're, we're thinking about you, bud, and, you know, keep up keep up the faith as you uh, look for your lost dragon orbs. <laughs> All right, yeah. Um, well, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got another one from Richard who says they better be eating Onyx potatoes during the review or maybe even Fizbin's chili. I told you, buddy, uh, we are going to do this. I ended up uh, getting the leaves of from the Inn of the Last Home, uh, actually a book that's like a source book. Uh, for gaming that I would highly recommend. If, you, if you're if you liking this universe and haven't jumped in uh, wholeheartedly yet, uh, pick up that. There's kind of a lot of history and all that kind of thing. And songs. <laughs> and, and to oh, play around the fire. Oh, great. Um, but recipes. So I'm telling you guys, uh, when we do next month, when we do spring dawning, uh, I am going to cook up a bunch of these Ooh. recipes. All right. All right. And we will, during Tavern Talk, we will, we will review... Uh, different dishes from the world of Kryn. I would like to point something out to you, Bob, however, though. I need to ask you a big favor here. We have a very small studio. Can we not do Fizbin's chili? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really I don't want to do that. Everything. Oh, Fizbin's no, chili, no. spicy potatoes. All right, we've got one more from Dan. He says, I'm liking this. Thanks for the find. I think that the review is a bit skewed. Because they forget two important things, which we do mention at the beginning. That this is a product of its time from over 30 years ago. This book would not be written today. And this book was written to support the modules, which were both created by Hickman. With these in mind, I think that they wouldn't have been so harsh in their criticisms. So what do you think about the harshness of our criticisms? Because, you know, I I agree with you, Dan. Uh, Especially me. I'll take this first. I can be really uh, sometimes, I feel sometimes I'm being hypercritical. uh, And I'm trying to rein myself in in slightly uh, on that thing. But I get it. This, I mean, this was here to support a game. And I really shouldn't necessarily, maybe this is condescending sounding, but I shouldn't be holding it up to the same standard maybe that I would uh, kind of a traditionally released piece of literature that's been through the whole editorial process. I feel like maybe this was pushed through pretty fast, you know, as a way of supporting games. Well, and I think, too, that we have to remember that Dragonlance is like any other fandom. Mm -hmm. 
And there are things that you know, for, you will know from other parts of the fandom or from doing other things that automatically make you fill in the blanks in other episodes or in other media that comes across. You right. know, Bob, you get on me all the time because I keep saying, well, that's a D&D thing. Right. You know, I so I think we have to remember that as a group. And even though you're trying to read it as a kid, Paul, and yeah. you're reading it not look you're reading it intentionally <laughs> not looking for the D D things. The right. D D things are there and that's one of the things that made that has made Dragonlands have this fandom that it does have. Right. Which we are a part of. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. You know, you know, one of the things that I'd like to bring up right here is that, I, again, I, I get this whole thing. I consider myself a Dragonlance fan, which now people are throwing things against walls probably. Uh, in my spare time, I'm reading these books you on are. my own, and I, I am loving this thing. And and I agree. Here, the thing is, is when I review a book and I give it either a recommend or not recommend, uh, I am looking at it as okay. If somebody came up to me and said, "I like fantasy novels," you know, should I start here? You know, would I recommend that to them? Right? Mm-hmm. Not would like somebody who I know. Like I immediately recommended to you guys. You guys need to read Dragonlance because yep. you yeah. guys were into into Dungeons and Dragons. I knew you were primed for this kind of stuff. So uh, I take it again back to my Star Wars fandom. One of my favorite books growing up, and this is going to be crazy. I love to read Tales from the Mos Eisley Cantina. They came out with like a bunch of books, right? And they were all like, okay, Mos Eisley Cantina in the first Star Wars movie. <laughs> okay, what you can see there is I cocked my head like a dog <laughs> at Bob, like, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So when they get to the cantina and all those aliens pop up when they first meet Han Solo, right? Yeah. They wrote a book with little tiny vignette, little tiny stories about every single alien that you see there, right? I loved that book. Like, as a kid, I thought it was letting me in mm. on weird little back Ooh. knowledge that nobody else would know. Like, So then I could be like a super nerd and watch him be like, oh, that's so-and-so and that's so-and-so. And his backstory is this, right? And I, I loved it. I would recommend that book to anybody who really likes Star Wars. I would never recommend that book to anybody who was not a fan of Star Wars. Even casual fans I wouldn't recommend that book to. You know what I'm saying? So I I think there is that level of fandom, you know, what you're into, and is that recommendable to you? Yeah, the the only thing I want to bring up to... Maybe we're not we're not attacking we're not attacking you at all for asking, for making these comments about us. It's no. You know, in just, fact, I agree with yeah, you. Yeah, we we Make love that. Yeah, we want you to be part of the conversation, yeah. and that's the that's one I mean, of the is, fun things of all these media is the fact that we can have a conversation. Yeah, here. we right. don't necessarily have to agree with each other, but yeah. we're all at least pretending to be adults. So let's have the conversation. Yeah, and it's the, the only thing about my reviews is that I am taking it as a book. Right. I do know that it is a part of a bigger thing, but we're a fantasy and science fiction literature review show. Right. So I'm just trying to take it at its value. Right. And I'm trying to cut out that it's not a... Ta- like, I'm trying to look at it, okay, as a standalone mm-hmm. book. I went into a bookstore, pulled this off the shelf. Yep. Does it stand alone without me having played it at the gaming table, without source books, without anything extra? Does this stand alone as a, as a novel that I just pulled off the shelf? Mm-hmm. And I will say... Talking about the when these books were written, I mean, I wasn't alive at that time. I try to put myself, once again, back in that time. Sorry. God! <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> I know. That was, that was not nice, but, you know, whatever. Uh, so it's, it, I try to put myself in that time, but I don't, I don't know about it. So I just come from what I know and mm-hmm. from my mindset when I was 12, 13, I don't know, whatever. I will say I have recommended these books to some younger students, things like that. It's good. Right. right. Cool. And, and I, I totally agree with that, Paul. But hey, you guys, I we love all the all the comments that we're getting here, but we really need to start talking about this book. Hey, uh, we we want the comments to keep coming in. You know, send them in. Uh, Dungeons and Dweebs podcast at gmail.com. Facebook, obviously, we're pulling them off of there. Yeah. That's where the comments have been coming coming from. Uh, we love to hear feedback from you. And, of course, they could appear on the show. So. Yes. Search Dungeons & Dweebs on Facebook. Uh, look for the little picture that you're seeing on your podcast window right now. Twitter, at D and Dweebs. All right. So we're starting off with book two. So uh, the last episode... It took us over two hours to cover all of book one. We've got book two and book three yes. uh, to get through, so let's get well, into book it. Book two of volume two. Boy, the scheme really always screws me up. But okay, yeah. book two of volume two. All right, so we start off 
Michael Williams is here. He's got a song of the Ice Reaver, and it's really just kind of this uh, tale that sets up what's been happening with the party uh, and getting this second dragon orb from a place called Ice Wall. Right. Yes. And I've been, you know, I've been the guy who's been defending a lot of things that go on in here. I this song at the beginning that was a much better adventure than a lot of other things we've seen, and we're going to condense it into a song. I would, I would have much rather had the story of the adventure of actually getting the dragon orb rather than this insy little song, and then we pan over to Flint puking on a ship. I, I, I completely agree. We've just come off of Sylvanesti, mm -hmm. uh, which was awesome. We all agreed we're a really high point, a very high point. This would have been your second high, high point. You flash to the other party, and they're having this epic struggle in Ice Wall. Yep. Uh, I don't understand why this is all taken care of in, a, in a, a piece of poetry. I have to be completely honest here. When I first was reading through this book, as soon as I saw it was a song or a poem, I skipped it. But I, I went straight to chapter one and started reading and was extremely confused. I had to go back. Mm -hmm. I read. I did end up going back and reading through it. Right. And I agree entirely with you, but I... When I was first reading through this, just because of the past history of the songs and poems, I just I skipped right. it. I didn't in, care. But in all honesty, I don't know that you really need to go back to it all the time. I mean, you are kind of told what ends up happening. Yeah, I, I didn't read it. I didn't go back and read it. <laughs> <laughs> you, but but you, I, I had to go back okay. and read it. You start and then you start off after the song with this whole ship scene, which we'll get to. I know in a minute, and then you flash back and tell us the story that happened in the song. Right. And about the only thing I appreciated about the song was, hey, we finally ki we killed off two characters. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. So uh, Derek uh, and the two knights that joined the party, uh, two of the knights get killed. Yes, right? Brian and his friend get killed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the poor, pitiful life of Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Brian the knight. Brian the Sir knight. Sir Brian. Yeah. But again, good. I mean, we kind of knew they were red shirts when they came in here. Yes. Well, we kind of knew that I they mean, were I, I, assume, I assume Derek was too, though. Yeah, I, I, mean, I agree. I, I, I thought he was just kind of there red, to move the plot I, li I like using that uh, terminology for this. Red shirts. Yeah, he, yeah. yeah, they're red shirts. And yeah, I agree. I thought Derek was a red shirt as well. Um, but but no. Um, we're getting into chapter one then, and we go into the flight from Icewald. It's mm -hmm. titled, titled right? Um, they're trying to get to Sand Chris. Uh, we start off with a lot of kind of funniness with Flint being seasick. Mm -hmm. And kind of, they're bringing him pea soup. And I like this. This is kind of light. It's funny. Uh, again, I'm looking for high points. Mm -hmm. I, I like this stuff. I do. I do during the read. I, I am enjoying this. But kind of, it was a thought after the book that, I don't, Flint doesn't ever really get too much like mm -mm. cool stuff that he does. No. He's just a right. No, but what we get here is we get a third character trait. We've only had two character traits oh, for Flint true, so far. True, true. He's old <laughs> and he's a dwarf. Oh, and he doesn't we, like water. No, <laughs> and that's it. We yeah, get the yeah. third character we, trait if he gets seasick. We got that, <laughs> yeah, that exactly. in the first book. But I well, that he doesn't say, like water. Yeah, yeah, that he doesn't like water. I will say though, I love Tass and Flint. They are my. The dynamic duo. They are the dynamic duo. Right. I don't really care about anything else when they're when yep. they are like talking and they're back and forth and it just makes me laugh. Right. And I love it, that. It does make me wish for more from them because we get a lot of character development or or at least attempted character development mm -hmm. on, on the other ones. And the people that I always gravitate towards are the ones we know the least about. You know, I, I like stuff yeah. with Tasselhoff and Flint and Fizbin, and we really don't get anything mm -hmm. with them ever. And I wish that they were fleshed out just a little bit more. And like we talked about before, too, Hickman and Weiss shine when we're either doing dark or we're doing a little bit of this Keystone Cops, you know, Laurel and Hardy comedy here. Right, I With agree. With Flint, I, I'm dying, take my helmet, and Tasselhoff bouncing around going, aren't you going to need your helmet? <laughs> right. <laughs> but, like we said, you wouldn't have to have read the Song of the Ice Reaver, because then we're going to get the backstory about how they uh, find this silver dragon uh, frozen into an ice wall with a Knight of Salamnia on its back. I really like the visual here. Um, you know, I'm thinking of stuff from Forgotten Realms that I've read, and other things like that with kind of this dragon uh, in ice. I always like just, I'm going to say it, the juxtaposition <laughs> of, a, of a reptile, uh, like a dragon, uh, kind of surrounded by snow and ice. I've, I've always liked that. It, 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 I like the mm. thoughts it stirs in my mind. and it's, it's cool. And we get another color of dragon. 
Yeah, we get another color of dragon, dude frozen in the wall with a broken dragon lance. I honestly thought at some point here we were going to have like a weird Captain America moment where they were going to thaw <laughs> oh, him out. He's, he's he's okay. Okay. And, and all of a sudden we were going to have yet another yes. member of the party. Yeah, I, yeah, I, was, yeah, yeah. I wasn't thinking that, but that yeah. would, I would have been okay with it. I, I know, yeah. right? <laughs> it, I would say if you, if you had another character, you have to take one away. Well, they, right. they took two away. That's true, but they were not really. Yeah, not really. (laughs) What I like here is that we finally get a Dragonlance. I mean, here we go. We're in Dragonlance (laughs) book two, and we're finally seeing a guy riding on the back of a dragon. He's got a Dragonlance, and Elliston uses his magic to melt the ice around the Dragonlance. Uh, He can't get it. It's Sturm that that tries to to get the Dragonlance, and I'm. It's I'm sort of kind of feeling like we're led to believe that in some way there's there's kind of a connection between Sturm because he's a knight of Salamnia and the knight that's been frozen because the knight really I think we're led to believe releases the lance when Sturm yeah it's sort of a sword in the stone a kind of sword scenario. in the stone kind of scenario which I think too was I liked it because it was a great throwback to Taz getting or t- not Taz to Tannis getting his magical sword in book one. Yeah, right. No, I Where agree. he's the, all of a sudden we have another party member who is the only chosen one to be able to grab this weapon. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you know yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. Actually, oh, yeah. Yeah, I have written in my notes, Allah, Sword in the Stone. And I think, Allah. <laughs> on, on, honestly, Luke, you, you, you nailed it. I think it kind of we're in the beginning of book two. Uh, and and he is not a knight. Sturm is not a knight. Yeah, that is kind but of revealed. But yet he pulls the, the, the sword mm. from the stone, showing that he is destined to become a knight. Yeah, and it's sort of the, the beginning of that arc of right. Sturm not being a knight, but being better than most of them. Right, and, and especially, like and especially too. now what the knights have become versus oh, yeah. what they yeah. used to be. Yeah. Right, I, I like that too. We do find out, then again, it's driven home that... Derek's friends were killed fighting this uh, yeah. guy named Felthas or Feelthas. Um, There's got to be, let me know here, uh, Bob, you big Dragonlance fan, you. <laughs> Is there a book here? Uh, about Felthas? Yeah. Uh, you know, as far as where I've gotten, I don't know. Oh, Again, okay. I'm trying to wade through 130 yeah. books. Yeah, we, uh, I don't see how there's not a yeah. book on Felthas. We, we did tweet out the picture of the your piles of Dragonlance uh, yeah, books. Yeah. You can't call me not a fan. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, eventually I'll get there, I guess, and I can uh, tell you, you know, a year from now uh, if there is. Because remember, though, you Dragonlance fans, we're going to do, do Spring Dawning, and after that, uh, we're on to other things. We're coming back uh, next summer to start start on legends so and i'm looking at, i'm looking at my notes here and you know sturm pull sturm is the one that pulls the dragon lance out and it hands it to lorana mm-hmm. and so lorana is <laughs> carrying the broken dragon lance <laughs> and then we get a quick blurb here that all of a sudden Lor- lorana has all the special weapons because she also picked up she also somehow picked up tennis's sword when he dropped it at the end yeah you know i i i, I had to grab that yeah that point yeah yeah, and th- when that came up, I was kind of like, "What? Wait!" But there is so many of these like accoutrements <laughs> to try to keep to keep uh, straight that I'm like, "Okay, whatever." Well, Bob, that's a D and D thing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right, so on to chapter two: the white dragon captured. Um, again, I like this idea that th- there's this white dragon named Sleet, and right away we learn uh, from Sleet's point of view. Again, what they're doing right in this book is that we get points of view. Of our villains, I do which like I really that. like. Yeah. He's got a connection to the Dark Queen, and he knows the movements of our heroes and and things like that. And so he he's going to go and attack them as they're leaving. And, and I like, like again, we have a new color dragon here. Yeah, it yep. just it opens up that universe so many more to this. You know, the Rainbow Bridge of Dragons, mm-hmm. right? And. <laughs> I like the fact that we keep going in the dragon's heads. Mm-hmm. I, I and that like we that. keep getting this. I, I like this background information about, I always want to find out what, what the new toy does. Mm-hmm. What does the new dragon do? And we get this big info dump here about right. how the white dragons are the scouts because they're smaller and they're sleeker and they can fly better. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I like that. That was very well described for me. Do right. we get here that, I, I, and I have this, I, this is written down, the, the dragon lore that we get, um, white dragons are inbred. And that's mm. why they're smaller, and that's why they breathe ice. Oh, cool. And which I, the, super cool. I mean, you know, playing D&D, having read, you know, the Monster Manual from, from 3.5, the Monster Manual from 5e. Right. I just always assumed it was magic. And that's, you know, mm-hmm. dragons are just magic. That one breathes fire, that one breathes acid, that one breathes ice. It's cool. Right. But this kind of brings like a, almost a scientific element to it. 
And yeah, I kind of like the super cool. reality. I guess yeah. could you say reality? Yeah. <laughs> well, and <laughs> we just did. We just the, did. Thi- the thing with the white dragon, and I, I'm always the reference guy. I'm always the guy who's you know trying to relate it to things I know. And I had the I, I, with the white dragons, I have this weird Falcor from the Never Ending Story. <laughs> <in my head>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> he should have fur. Curdy, <laughs> that is that's a great reference. And it, it is talked about a lot too. Like uh, when we're in the dragons, had that point of view. About it being a little slower, right? Because it's inbred. Yeah, and, and you know, what, so you cool. know what I love so cool. about this part of the book is, I honestly, I think this entire three book series would make fantastic movies. I'd be the first one championing a movie being made out of these because I think it lends itself visually. There are so many visuals. Mm. Again, you're like listening, probably going, "You didn't even recommend the first book." I can see that first book as a movie under the right editor, uh, and so it'd be fantastic. And right here, I love this this idea of they're trying to get away. The dragon doesn't just come in. What I hate about a lot of modern movies is the quick cuts and jump oh, cuts yeah. all over the place. I would love to see this where the ship, just long shots of a ship trying to flee, and this dragon that's not attacking. It's, it's just, just chilling. It's just it's just there. It's circling. It's just toying with them. Everybody's on the periphery of the dragon fear. It's going to build that tension. Yeah. It's almost like a inverted jaws moment where it's just <laughs> circling and circling but not attacking. And there's some great writing in here when we flip back to the sh- to the crew of the ship. And how everybody's panicking and everybody's going, it's just, it's flying around and the dragon's going around. And I, it, there's some great writing that really induces that panic of being at sea. And all of a sudden there's just a dragon flying around your ship that keeps looking at you. Right. Yeah. yeah. This, well, is, this is already scary. Like, yeah. Right. Oh, and a dragon. Good. And then finally it does attack and um, it, it breathes its freezing breath and it wrecks it on an island off of Urgoth. Uh, and it's driven off by Lamana. That, that was pretty cool too. Like everybody took cover in like uh, what I can't boat boat speak ships uh, <laughs> below deck in the hold below deck, <laughs> the hold. and right. it the freezes them and they're trapped. Right. Yeah. I would be freaking out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're in a boat that's gonna sink and you can't get out. Right. And yeah. it's night. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, and, yeah. I think, like we said, they do scary. Well, yeah. You Bryce know, and Hickman do this well. What I don't get is there does seem to be a trepidation on their part to go into action scenes and mm-hmm. fighting, and like they tend to err on the side of people talking to each other. Definitely, that's not their strong suit. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like like their character development is is lackluster at best a lot of the times. But when they do this kind of stuff, it's good. Stick with this. Again, mm-hmm. why did you skip over this entire fight <laughs> at the beginning? <laughs> this is what you should be writing uh, and. I love the D and the D and D role aspect here too. Oh, because heck. everybody, everybody, sta- you know, we have the elves who can see in the dark, obviously, mm-hmm. so they can see the white dragon flying around. Everybody else is huddling below, and all the elves are shooting at the dragon. And of course, who rolls the decent roll to actually hit <laughs> yeah. the dragon? The one with low light vision. The one you hate. <laughs> yeah. I don't hate her. No, I'm no, just no. saying if I had to choose. <laughs> <laughs> I take the princess. Um, but anyway. Yeah, uh, we know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he Lorana wings this dragon and it flies off, which I kind of like. Uh, I like that what I was expecting was a big standoff with this mm-hmm. dragon. It doesn't happen. Just kind of wings it with an arrow and he's like, ah, I'm going home. No. And he leaves. Uh, and, and I like that. It's, it's kind it's, of it's unexpected. It's a wimpy, dumb, inbred dragon. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I will say, I like how it shows the mortality of dragons as well. Oh, where yeah. it's not... For the for the past few books, it just seems like dragons are a big, That's a scary very good point. thing. But this shows the mortality of them. And yes, they can get hurt. It's not one of the you shoot an arrow, it's just going to bounce off. It's you put it through its wing, it's going to get hurt. It's not going to like that. Yeah, that's, that's a very right. good point. Maybe, maybe it was more something with uh, I'm, I'm just my my mind's going back to Ember when you know he there was a a, a moment in that where he could have lost the fight and he knew it. But he didn't. And I think that was more of the pride of a red dragon, and that's okay. Yeah. But, you know, these chromatic dragons should be more self-centered, more about mm-hmm. self-preservation. Yeah. yeah. And that is, I, I that's like a that. very good point. And the fleshing, again, the fleshing out of the dragon community. He's a, Sleet is a scout. Right. The yeah. Sleet, the, yeah. The, the, uh, oh, God, I got shot. I'm a scout. I'm yeah. not supposed to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm just reporting back, uh, you know, and that, yeah, I'm getting out of here. I really like this. 
Um, so anyway, though, we're on Urgoth, and here come the elves, because it turns out we've just landed in a nest of them. <laughs> well, and, and it's a good, so, it's, but it's a good thing that we lost all these nameless sailors. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is true. Hey, let's whittle down the party. If, if they named them, we would know <laughs> yes, all about them. Because now our party's small enough to be surrounded by the elves. Uh, exactly. Um, you know what I like here, though, is uh, there's kind of a standoff with these elves on the beach, mm. and Lorana... Uh, you know, I, she's really coming into her own as a leader. In all honesty, she wasn't really hitting my scales in the last book. You know, she wasn't gauging very much. You know, she was just like, oh, yeah, she's in love with Tannis, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, she, was, she was more so just annoying that... Yeah. Um, you know, she, it, it, was, I, it was really interesting when she was there, and we got that little... Um, ex, uh, it was expanded upon uh, Tannis... Tannis's love triangle that's going on right, right. with her. Um, but yeah, now she is like, there's some character development going yeah, on. Yeah, she is going to really, good. she's going to grow here. And in fact, I'm going to throw it out here, uh, spoiler for the end of the book, that I think Lorana has the greatest arc in this book. Definitely. Uh, where, where she grows through. And um, she has a good arc. She has a, she has a, a good arc. And yeah. And I, I'll put her there with Sturm. Um, and she's becoming more of a leader here. She's negotiating. I like that. We find out that there's another tribe of elves called the Kaganesti, which are the wilder elves. Everything in three. I got to throw it out here. Uh, I ended up getting a, a, a bunch of the old 80s TSR comic books. Um, they are hit and miss. I, I do enjoy reading them, but man... People, oh, I, you I got, didn't even, you brought them over, and I didn't even, I, I didn't even think to look at how did the Cognesti look. Okay, horrible. Oh, uh, no, yeah, so uh, no. it, it, the, the series suffers from the fact that uh, there's lots of different artists that work on each book, and man, these Cognesti. I was so excited when I got the issue. I'm like, how did they draw these elves? <laughs> and what Pro Magnon man comes to mind. And when I started reading this and when all of a sudden we find out about, hey, okay, there's another race of elves, and they started talking about them. All that jumped into my head right away, and it was quickly dismissed, but yeah. all that jumped into my head right away is, oh my god, are these the gully dwarves of the elves? Yeah, yes! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are, we, are, we taking this, are we taking this archetype we've established with the gully dwarves and right. saying that there's, there's, garbage, there's garbage people of every race? You know, and it's weird because <laughs> that you say that because, in all honesty, I bet you beat for beat we're probably bringing these guys in about where gully dwarves were brought into the and last this, book. Yeah. This might be... Where it started. I'm coming to you as somebody with knowledge of D and D in 2017. Right. This just kind of seems to be what you know, Wizards of the Coast or TSR does. Right. Is there's always a different version of mm. you know? Well, there's to give choice to the player, or maybe what, uh, what what I'm equating it to is um, the the Underdark in mm. more recent versions. You okay. have you have okay. Your, your, I'll buy that. Your Drow. The um, Dark Elves. Right. Love. There are um, Skulks, your Dark Humans. Mm -hmm. And there are, ooh, help me out, Paul. Uh, the Dark I, the dark Dwarves. Um, um, everybody's screaming out at <laughs> it's in okay. their earbuds. Uh, it's okay. Message us on Facebook if we can't get it. Yeah, I'll, 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 think, <laughs> I'll, I'll think of it and I'll yell it and, in a minute here. But yeah, it's, yeah. they always do like, hey, we have a new like flavor of character right. like the garbage race so we'll have the garbage dwarves and we'll have the garbage elves right if we come into book or volume three and there's garbage humans i'm gonna flip out are there dirty little garbage kinder <laughs> i guess so <laughs> hey but we get we get a we get a new character here maybe that's the garbage human Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. We get a new character here who's not garbage, Silvara. Oh, uh, yes. she, she's oh. a healer. I, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, but wait a minute. We have, we have a new race, and there's somebody with silver hair. Okay, don't. Oh, I know where you're going with this, and let, we're, <laughs> we're going to get to it. Oh, my God. Okay. And we're going to get to it. I just want to point out here, I called this from the mo. I called this in my head from the moment she walked up. Okay, th this, I, I've never written so many times throughout my notes than, yeah, if... From almost the time she is introduced, and especially by the first time you hear what she really... The first... We'll get to it. I'm going to talk about it later. I've never written... If you don't know this, you're an idiot so many times <laughs> in my notes. Draugr. Draugr. The dark dwarves are called Draugr. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, nice. Nice. Uh, she's kind of enslaved by the other elves. And again, this is an inversion on a lot of times what we know about elves, I feel, or at least what I've always held to be true about elves. Again, this old race that's supposed to be kind of the chosen of the gods, and I guess this is supposed to show that they've... Uh, fallen from grace in some way that they're they have slaves they've made slaves of yep. the other race and 
I was the first to jump in when we started talking about the elves to begin with in book one and how, you know, every elven culture always bothers me because we're yeah. so much better than everybody else. I will say this was a very good choice in my yep. book for Weiss and Hickman because it really humanized the elves. It's right. like, okay, wow. Elves have slaves. That's not cool. Yeah, you know what? It, you know what it did it almost pushed them so far over the edge in my mind because I yeah I didn't like them in the last book and here I'm still disliking the elves. But it gives me like almost like a legitimate reason to not like them. Like okay, I guess you are pushing this idea of these elves are so degenerate because I always have trouble with the fact that you're this old wise race but you're acting so stupid. You know, like, it doesn't seem to be the archetype. Like, they should be kind of wise. And if they do anything that seems kind of douchey, it's because they have knowledge of things that you don't as kind of a mortal. You know, this yeah. pushes them over that edge of being like, no, you are just degenerate as a race in a lot of ways. But this whole this whole thing, we're, we're on this, this island here where all the elves have come to sort of become refugees and hide. Right. And what this is really doing for me is it's showing just how chaotic the world is right now. Right. Yes. I mean, yes. You, you do have, I mean, this old race where we are learning their faults. I mean, it, you know, it right. doesn't matter how old you are and how wise you are. You're still slave owners. Yep. But I'm hearing engines in the back of my mind. Uh, I'm starting to rev up with problems. Okay. okay. I can hear right. it starting to come. And from here, it's going to just start crescendoing from this point on. Okay. Um, again, these are elves and they've, they've traveled to this island of Urgoth. I don't know. I've pulled out a map. I've looked at what Kryn is supposed to look like, okay? I'm judging maybe this is like roughly the size of North America. I don't know how big Kryn is. But these idiots think that they're safe from the invasion if they just stay on this island. I don't understand how an old, wise race like the elves, again, this might be trying to underline where they've sunk to, but they're all acting like if we just stick it out here, all this will avoid us. Again, I like the idea more in Tolkien where they're leaving. They're literally leaving. You know, here they're just kind of hanging out. Yep. Dragon dragons can't cross water. Yeah. That's, oh, I don't. I don't like this. Fine. Uh, I, I think. I think it's more the fact that they would have to scout out that far. Like the dragons don't know where the elves went. Right. But if you kind of look at maps. I, Boy, I mean, it's just right there. It's kind of like people sitting on Britain during in, in Britain during World War II, going, "Hitler's not going to come here. <laughs> we're, we're fine." Well, they do. They, they, <laughs> and actually, that was that was the pompousness that I took from that. Yeah, is maybe I, I, is I took that aspect of, okay, uh, all right, we're here, we're on an island, nobody knows we're on the island. If we just right. sit here, we can wait it out. Yeah, but you know what? Th this does drive home to me kind of sometimes my frustration. I like the idea, but there's part of me that likes the idea of all of these races are split up and even in the face of this looming threat and really annihilation of their cultures, they're not going to unite. But it was said that, I believe it was Weiss did a lot of researching on World War II. Even in World War II, I mean, the Allies united with, the USSR, I mean, Stalin was um, in many ways worse than Hitler, but they were able to put things aside and fight a common evil enemy. I feel like there would have been more realism if some of these nations were able to at least, there should be more conflict going on here where nations want, like maybe parts of these nations want to get together, want to work things out and form plans to fight these dragons, uh, but they're still all so isolated that they they cease to be real to me and start to be caricatures uh, of reality. You and know, like nobody would honestly be this stuck in the mud. We are not working. The dwarves are not working with anybody. You know, Tarsus is not working with anybody. The elves are not working with anybody. And I'm just going, none of this is now real. I mean, uh, we're talking about dragons on print, <laughs> but none of this feels real. Okay. Like how actually societies would be. And I want our audience right now to take a huge timestamp. <laughs> and especially the dude from Facebook to take a huge timestamp time right now within the podcast because I am going to say that this is a point where Lorana becomes a actual character to me. Oh. This is the point where I actually begin to n n n like her. I, can't, I have a hard time getting it out. <laughs> <laughs> and it's simply this well-written, beautiful, little tiny paragraph scene where all the other elves are looking down and all the other elves are looking down their noses at this dirty at this dirty little garbage elf 
who, who, <laughs> yeah. who your druids again come up, yeah. had learned the druid <laughs> healing ways, <laughs> right. and comes in, and they're really almost abusing her, but Lorana, is, Lorana treats her so kindly and so nicely here, even though we have a little blurb from her, too, about how she knows these are the crap elves, and we're not supposed to treat them well, but... Lorana treats her nicely, and they start this little they start this little friendship here between yep. Lorana and uh, Silver Silvara Silvara. Yeah. And so this is the point. Mm-hmm. This is a point here where, okay, you can stay with the party in my book, Lorana. Yeah, okay, you're okay. You treated you you you, you treated the dirty homeless girl nice. I mean, I'm okay. you're, you're you're defending and yet trash talking Lorana a little bit. What happens here is all of a sudden, oh yeah, Portheos. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Where, where the heck have you been? Yeah, no, oh, I agree. Oh, he's in love. I do okay. want to go yeah. on uh, continuing with kind of Clob's idea of Lorana's character development, though, because, again, you could probably do a timestamp for me as well, because I just got done praising Lorana, and here's where I'm going to continue liking Lorana and turning against one thing that I dislike that the authors have done here, and it's that Lorana, you know, has... Her father is the speaker of the sons, and and they have all this dialogue that goes on. But at the end, he gets really heated, and because of his her relationship to Tannis, call, pretty much is going to call her a whore, right? Well, and, and then then Lorana. Here's what I like. What what I like is that there's this tension between daughter and father, and he's pretty much like this relationship I don't like, but is it almost calls her a whore. This is where Lorana, you become strong. Speaking like, of this family, um, I will like to point out the fact that I meant Gilthanus and not Portheos. <laughs> but, <laughs> this is going to be the episode where Luke corrects himself. <laughs> or Luke corrects himself. Well, hey, none of us caught it either. <laughs> well, Except Paul. But, Paul, Paul but opened his book and pointed out the name. <laughs> but here's the thing. Da- so, Sorry, so, I, I want to be something. Yeah, it's okay. So Dad calls Lorana, you know, the, uh, pretty much almost calls her a whore. What I don't like is Lorana should have... This is where I feel she should have gained enough strength to kick against her father. She faints. And I hate that. That is where I'm like, okay, you maybe you wanted to show her as the last moment of weakness where she crumbled. I, did, I didn't like this Th- moment. That, that, that's kind of what I took it as. It was the yeah. uh, the, the last... I, I This started and I thought it was annoying. But by the end of it, I'm like, yes. This is so good, and I thought, that's how I was. But I thought until we, she fainted, I didn't like that she fainted. Like that strips her. Oh, no, I, I thought I thought it was annoying even up until that point. Oh, it was okay. After like oh when, yeah yeah yeah. And I so at this point had checked out of this entire scene <laughs> because that's, that's I would say that's more where I was. Be, at. Yeah, be, because yeah, yeah. It w- because it all of a sudden okay hey we start the book with a song. We have some interesting information that comes around. You know, it's been a while since we had a dinner or a Senate scene. <laughs> <laughs> Again, exactly. I, I feel that the, the elves are constantly just really kind of like this stumbling block where we just need to drag down our, our heroes for a while in some bog them down in some mire for a while. Yeah. Let's stick them in with the elves because the elves are going to get all wordy. They're going to talk and, and things will get screwed up. But again, it should be said, they have a dragon orb, which we know is kind of a key to fighting dragons. Uh, so she's going to take that and the lance, which is also key, and decide that they're going to they're gonna get the heck out of here mm-hmm. and go uh, to San Chris to bring everything there. Which is, again, I, I have wanted this from the beginning. This is exactly what you should be doing with this stuff, yeah. is get it to the knights who know what they're doing with it. You need to fight these dragons. And like we were talking about Thorn... Bo- thorn Bloodum? <laughs> thorn Bottom? <laughs> Thorn Bloom. <laughs> no, I, I'm, ex- I'm right there with you. Thorn- I, I read Thorn Bloom every time. <laughs> uh, Th- Th- uh, Throm and Bot. Theros the- Ironfell. No, no, the, there's the, a place. The dwarf, the yeah. dwarven, uh, the dwarven under the hill city uh, with the gates. Oh, 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 Thor Barden. Thor Barden. Yeah. <laughs> and like we talked about with Thor Barden, <laughs> we didn't need this beginning scene of Thor Barden. Right. We didn't need to go to the island of the wayward elves. Hey, I'm gonna throw it out there. Vindication in the comic book adaptation of it, that book starts there is no Thor Barden in it. It starts really? right with the dragons. Uh, even Roy Thomas knew what he was doing. Cut that stuff <laughs> right out of there. Yeah. <laughs> it starts with dragons and a dragon island. It Hilo. starts with yeah, dragons and them going to Tarsus. And I, so, I, I could have completely done without this entire island of the misfit elves. <laughs> and just go directly to we where we need to go. The yeah. island of myth. 
Asphodels. Just, just completely skip this. Have them land. You know, have them be hit by the dragon at sea. Have them land on the beach on fifty miles away from yeah. the next city. We're supposed at to Dunkirk. Go to. <laughs> Let, yes. Let's let's be done. I, I didn't need another Senate scene. I didn't need these poor mommy issues. Right. I'm okay. Like I said, I liked the fact that Lorana. Th- this one snippet scene here for Lorana for me between her and between um, Savara. Yes, okay, she became her more human. They could have found her on the beach next yeah. to the other yeah, city. Yeah, no, I yeah. agree. I agree. And so then they're deciding they're going to leave with this thing. Well, they I, I end just, up... I'm going to defend it real quick. Uh, oh, okay. I, I am, I am. I... Elf guy. Elf lover. <laughs> <laughs> For reals. Uh, you know, I, it's, it did start out super annoying, and I was really worried about where it was going to go. Mm-hmm. But then when I said, oh... Lorana, uh, she's she's all worried about what her dad's gonna think, and then she's like, "No, I know what I want to do." Yeah, and yeah. she just gets tough, right? Tells him off, and I'm like, "Okay, cool." Uh, Gilthanus is gonna stay here with his new girlfriend. We're gonna lose a party member. Right. It's gonna become a smaller party. It's gonna get a lot better. We can really dive into who right. these characters are, and we're starting to dive into who right. Lorana is. I, yeah, yeah, I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's been all gold for me so far, except for that fainting. I believe that's the big like. <laughs> Why did you have her face? And I, I took that as like, like a weird, like, uh, like the last psych, gasp psych of her. Yeah, like yeah, weird, yeah. Like, oh, oh, hey, L- Lorana's a wimp. She has no, lived, she's not. She, we, I guess we should point out she's yeah. lived, you know, over a hundred years or so that, or something like that. So I guess it's been ingrained in her. Her father says yes. something. It takes. That's, that's a very her. good point. That's yeah. It's an even better point than I could even bring up. Yeah. And so I love uh, the fact too that sneaking out in the middle of the night, we we bring the human with us. We we bring Theros Ironfeld. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 uh, I, wrote, I wrote him down as Robo Blacksmith. Yeah, <laughs> which Robo I talked about, which I talked about when we were doing the movie review. <laughs> yes, because I don't. And even, that, that confused me. I'm I like, don't even. I don't even remember Robo him Robo from arm? the first yeah. book. But when we did the movie review and he was thrown in there, and I was talking about, you know, he had the Robo arm, and that this is where I was remembering it from. Right. And I, this dude, I love. I love uh, this dude as a character. I always picture him as like, I always picture him as like that Luke Cage, like the big black man with the war with the arm. Right. Yeah. Right. And again, I feel. Like yeah. one of yeah. one of the problems, is, and again, uh, going back to to the the fact that this is a game and things like that, there are really good ideas here that don't. The things that I kind of want fleshed out don't get fleshed out, and the things I don't want fleshed out are fleshed out. There was Ironfeld, like you said, cool character. He is like pivotal to this story. He is. Yeah. We really don't ever get to know him. We don't know what he's about. He's just kind of tagging along Wait, with his well, robot arm. Have, what would you have said if we did like dive into Theros? I feel like that would have been just It'd be too much. But that's yeah. why I'm saying, actually, kind of my whole deal, I-, I can almost not articulate how we have to totally restructure everything yeah. in these novels to bring bring in the things that I think are important. I, I just have one question. Is there a book about Theros? Oh, yes. Uh, it's <laughs> what I thought. Yeah, yes, I, I thought about okay. that. Yeah, yeah. So, I will say, the politics of this, I didn't really like. Right. Once, I never do. I will just read past it and skim it. Mm-hmm. But I really enjoyed this island once they got through the politics. Right. I will say that. I enjoyed I was it. Okay I don't it. think yep. they... The middle of the night sneaking away... Was were, was well written. I liked I it. Loved I'll it. give I it that. It. I'll give it that. I just don't. Th- for me, it didn't make up for. Okay, I don't want to hear about politics anymore. Right. And as we're sneaking away, we do have a little bit of a MacGuffin here. <laughs> we do have the little bit of a MacGuffin. We do have a little bit of the. Okay, this is convenient to the plot now. Yeah. Because did you guys? Do you guys remember what happened to the dragon orb when she sneaks in to steal it? Oh yeah, I have that. Yep, that's in my notes. <laughs> um, actually, I wrote it down as Silvara was chosen by the orb. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I was talking about the fact that it goes from evidently being this like beach ball sized dragon arm to like a softball. So yeah. you can put it in a bag. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 was, you know? that was really weird at this point, but I mean, throughout the book, you kind of get the idea that these things are just super magical and. Oh, they do have a ever- consciousness of their own. Yeah, I understand. They, they well, yeah, their own there, there is that, but they're ever changing as well. Right. And I'm going to throw out again, uh, kind of throwing back to Theros Ironfeld. I do. We're a kind of a book review podcast. If there's something that I highly recommend people doing, is I feel that. Weiss and Hickman do kind of play upon a lot of mythology and just grab what they think is cool. And I'm going to get to that in future things here where I think they just take 
symbolism and pictures of things that they think are cool and just yep. jam them in here. Um, but Theros Ironfell, to me, is straight up Irish legend uh, out of a, 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 an ancient Irish legend. And you should check out the Book of Conquest by Jim Fitzpatrick. It's like a guy who who's like kind of an artist and he did this... this uh, uh, book taking Irish legends and kind of making pictures uh, that go along with it. It's cool. Mm-hmm. And Theros Ironfeld is definitely like Nuwada uh, from okay. the Tuatha to Danon from there. It's 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 cool. This idea of a silver arm. But I'm gonna I'm gonna get you, Hickman. I know where you got this idea from. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is definitely from the Tuatha to Danon. And did you catch as we're sneaking out of town here? Mm-hmm. The whole, the, 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 the uh, with Silvara, the whole Lord of the Rings, my precious. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely, definitely. Okay, so Silvara, uh, tell, they get to this river of the dead, um, and Silvara. Well, we, we're leading up to that, and what what I'm I'm getting excited about is we're getting rid of Gilthanas and we're getting rid of Silvara. What I thought was starting to become a two massive parties on yeah. either side of this book. I'm getting excited, like, oh wait, we're gonna we're gonna narrow it down, we're gonna, we're gonna drill keep... it, drill into who they are. Oh wait, no. Right now, our our party is Flint, Lorana, Gilthanas, <laughs> Derek, Sturm, Theros, and Silvara. Yeah. Uh, in all honesty, there are times where I'm reading this and forgetting who is in this party and who isn't. I'm telling you, reading the comics was better because you had constant visual representations of these people. And that's what you need. You need it. This is why I say these would, this would make a fine movie because these people would constantly be on the screen and you'd know who the heck was there. I can't keep them straight all the time in this book. Um, but we get to this River of the Dead and Silvara, Silvara, Silvara tells this legend of a... Of a Huma and the silver dragon and how Huma loves a woman and everything. It is at this point that I have, you're an idiot if you don't know Silvara as a dragon. Not hi, a dragon. Hi, my name is, <laughs> hi, my yeah. hi, my name is Luke and I'm an idiot. Yeah. Oh, I, had no, oh, I, had no. No, I had no idea. You're kidding me. Oh, Silvara there's, there's and silver too, hair. There is too much going on in this book for me th- to key in true. on this stuff. This is true. And maybe they're relying on that, that we are going to throw so much at the wall, people are mm. not going to know what's going on. Because I think there's... That going and on. and there, there really hasn't been anything that's been like hidden like that. That's true. That is true. It's been, all been very on the nose, and like now this series is kind of starting to like come into its own. Right. That 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 is true. Mm-hmm. That is that is true. And just as I was getting on Lorana's, just like I was coming, I was coming over. I was at, I wasn't getting to be Team Lorana, but I was at least kind of understanding why there were people on Team Lorana. Yeah. We get this Tannis like section. Mm-hmm. Where yeah. it's just this. Yeah, and are Gelthanus and Silvara? Are you talking? No, about? with Lorana, where we get this tennis-like section here of at the beginning of chapter. What is it? Four. Four. At at or at the beginning of chapter four, where it's just. Oh, and I remember way back when I lived in a perfect colony, and I don't understand what I'm going to do, and I understand that it's being bad to the other race of elves, and I should stay and help, but I have to go save the world, and I don't. G- Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't like emo tannis. Let's yeah. not have you know. Emo uh, again, when what they're weak at, and I'm just gonna point. You can agree with me or not, but they are not good at writing this kind of exposition where with, no. with characters talking to each other and trying to talk about inward feelings and things. It it really kind of falls apart. I feel, and it's really teenagerish. It's like if some a teenager were to walk up to me and be like, "I just wrote this about my feelings between me and my boyfriend." Th- this is what I'd be reading a lot of this. I I don't like it. It goes on with Gilthanus and. Silvara. I hate to say this. I actually like this Gilthana Silvara relationship, but I hate that every single just I'm a guy, I'm the new girl, we're just hooking up. Like everybody just constantly just hooks up for the sake that they're just it's just the two people. I, I, together. And I like this because I knew that event because yes, Gilthanus is part of our party. Gilthanus is, you know, somebody who wants to be some who wants to be part of our party, who wants to be someone that you know, is doing good for his people, but he's still kind of, he's still kind of coming across as crap to me. He's still kind of coming across as I'm too good for everybody else. Mm -hmm. So now we have this relationship with this girl who I know at this point that, yeah, the cross species thing isn't going to be in his <laughs> favor, right, right? But no, but he's still like, I know this is going to come to an issue, and I know this is going to knock him down a couple pegs. So I'm all about this relationship. Oh, okay, let's get into this relationship because we got to move. But chapter five, um, this is, chapter five is my guilty pleasure. Is it? I, I actually, <laughs> you know, you know, like, okay. it, it kind of became like I, the, 
the Gafana Silvara relationship with I mean it's very medieval, very yep. like I think you're pretty. Let's get married. You know what? Like, here, yeah. Sort of thing. Here's the thing that I will say. I am split on this. Silvara, I love this chapter because it's very titillating. Uh, and, and, I, and I do like it. It's, this is the chapter that I know was written by Hickman, not by Weiss. Oh. She did, she did. I don't know, I can't remember if she was like, kind of like, I can't get this right. And then Hickman just comes in and like, I can write love. And then he just <laughs> writes all this. But, uh, I, I mean, the picture at the beginning is very suggestive. Uh, it's kind of, you know. Yeah, you, you have the uh, larger tome version of I this. I have the larger you tome get, version. You get a bit more pixels. There's a bit more pixels here to flesh things out a bit. Oh, um, yeah. Flesh so, out. I like this. Again, from a novel writing standpoint, why in the heck are you taking two characters that are on the periphery and then fleshing out their love story and having a moment with one of them in a pool naked in the in the moonlight yeah. and stuff like that? This is, I mean, this is all wrong. You you don't focus on these characters. I mean, this is somebody else. This would have been like a, and so Lorana would have never done this. But you know. You take your main love stories, that's what you flesh out. You don't all of a sudden, oh, we got Silvara, she just is with us. We're going to flesh out her you know, love I, story. I was going to kind of give it a bit of a, like, a, a Game of Thrones yeah. nod. That. I'm throwing it back to pulp stuff. I think it's pulp like pulpy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, pulpy. and I completely took this as the the nerdy girl takes off her glasses, lets her hair down, and all of a sudden she's yes. beautiful. Yes, uh, yeah, it's totally that. Yeah. You, cle you yeah. clean up the slave, and oh my god, she's pretty, and oh, I could love her if she's pretty. <laughs> That's the weirdest thing I've ever heard you say. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of weird, suggestive language here. I mean, good on you, Hickman. Silvara is, is a doe, and she's trembling and quivering. I mean, way to go, Tracy. Again, I mean, it's just a boot scene. We're not you know, it's just teased without boots. Without yeah. without any boots, you know. But again, I, 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 it's all off in terms of why they're just falling in love. Falling in love. That's just because they're there, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but Gilthanus decides to bring the orb to the knights at San Christ. You know, he thinks that's good. And again, I have written Silvara's a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have nothing at this point. <laughs> so um, again, I, I do have written. A, ancillary character love story why are you focusing on this but I, I'm appreciative of chapter 5 it was kind of a nice break <laughs> between all was, the I, I think I, <laughs> tension release maybe, maybe guilty pleasure is a good word for it but I did I, I enjoyed chapter 5 I enjoyed Gilthanus and Solara's yep. love story and maybe it's because I've watched Game of Thrones at this point and I, yep. I like diving into each character right ha ha hashtag mind boobs yeah, yeah, again, it's, at, well, they're just right out there in the open in this For one. sure. Yeah. Mind boobs. Okay, so we're, got, we're moving. Chapter 6, uh, Pursuit and a Desperate Plan. San Chris is this last stronghold of the Salamnic Knights, and it's the only hope. I've said this for a long time. they got to get to San Christ. Um, and it's the only place big enough to stop this invasion. Um, so Elliston and Lorana, you know, they know this, and they're going to bring the orb there and the lance. Right, a lot of this stuff though is told like in my book. It's told in the the uh, the annotations, kind of the importance of a lot of this stuff, and I don't feel it comes through in the narration all the time. And again, I feel where Weiss and Hickman start to stumble is on creating a larger world feel of this invasion and where these cities are in relationship to each other and, and what the plan is here for stopping invasion. You, you wouldn't think these places are just letting this dragon army roll over them, that there's some sort of uh, pushback, they have some sort of plans, but it, it just seems like there's uh, there, there isn't. So they decide... Um, uh, there's a lot pushed here about distrust with Silvara. This is where we far, first start getting this whole. I, I think I think this is what trust. Yeah, Silvara. This, this threw me off the dragon thing. Mm. I thought maybe she was working with them. Oh, not okay. that she was one. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I get it. And I took. Yeah. And looking at this too, it's she's back in the cave. She's doing some weird things yeah. on the floor. That made no yeah. sense. I still don't really. Yeah, 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 was, yeah, even after see, that was that was more of a golem moment for me. Yeah. That was just oh my precious, I'm gonna sit and look at the orb and I'm gonna play with it. Yeah. It's, so it's does lovely. any do any of you know what was she doing? I still don't yes. know what. Yes. She was yes. Doing. Yes. 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 Okay. yes. She was legitimately giving them where a certain part of their party went. Correct? Am I right? uh, we'll get to, to it. To the Cognasty? Yeah. We can say it. Yeah, but yeah to the Cognasty. Okay. I will say, this entire pursuit, I loved. I, I don't I mind it. Yeah. The yeah, there were good, there were good things that went on the, with her. I like that there was that little break, and then I love how the pursuit just immediately picked up again, and they 
the tension rose again. Right. Oh, yeah. those right. I mean, we should say the elves are ticked off. That I mean, you know, it makes sense. They, they should be. They should be. Yeah. They, they wanted to keep the orb for themselves in the mm-hmm. lance and, and to help them defend it. So they're sending elves to, like, chase them down and take it back. Um, so in, in this pursuit, they decide we should split up the group. Also a good idea. Well, Stir. the split party splits again. Yeah, again, yeah, we're, we are juggling parties. too many groups here. Mm-hmm. Now well, we have three. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, well, gang, time to split up. <laughs> oh, oh, so I, don't, so I, I don't know about that, Fred. <laughs> so they split up again. Sturm and Derek are supposed to take this orb to San Chris. Again, leadership here is always kind of questionable to me. And you have one character who kind of wants to kill or imprison the other. And they're the only two entrusted with the nuclear bomb. I, I like, <laughs> like I like that idea. I, I, I kind of feel it's, but it it's doesn't really, planning. It doesn't but really go anywhere. Because you don't well, travel I mean, with them. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it eventually does go somewhere. Yeah. But at the end of their journey, yeah, yeah. I, I would have read that. Like, I don't, like, yeah, I was all about the two guys who hate each other, but yeah. know they have to do the same, but know that they have to get through this mission together. Yeah, th- those yeah. two, and like, the, not sleeping at night, just, like, looking over their shoulders the whole time. And I would have yeah. loved to read this story of them, of Sturm and Derek, going and bringing the orb because... And I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it because I was waiting for almost that buddy cop moment, right? Where you have the where you have the two guys who are just at their at each other's throats, but they know they have to do the mission, and then they're best yeah. friends by the end. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I will say, I feel like if they gave us that, we might be tearing it apart because the one thing we always seem to be talking about is whenever they write about emotions and how people start to feel. No, I agree. We start to tear it apart. And I feel like that might be good that they just avoided having them go through the woods and have that tension because maybe that's just not their strong suit. Well, and even not so much the emotions, but just, you know, the one, that that one scene that's within a lot of the buddy movies or the buddy books and the things like that where... You know, Derek hates Sturm, and Sturm's not a you know Sturm's not a real knight. And then something happens along the way, like they're climbing a cliff, and Derek falls, and Sturm has the chance to let him go, but because Sturm's so honorable, he saves him, and so then Derek rethinks how he feels. I, I would have thrown this book against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I'm I'm with you, Luke. Yeah. Uh, so Silvara is acting weird, and they and they she, end she's up. She's like enchanting the party. She's enchanting the party and stuff like that, and she's gonna say we're gonna. Take him to an ancient and, and hiding place, and it's never. I, I guess maybe it, it doesn't come. Nothing comes of this. I, so there's maybe, things maybe she does. This, I don't know. Maybe this why is for you guys it. who like understood that she was a dragon at this point. I don't understand, and I thought she was a dragon. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I what I think what I wrote down was like Silvara is enchanting everyone. Everyone, I'm confused. You know, I, I'm not kidding. Maybe pr- there's probably books written to explain why she's doing what she's doing. But there are parts of this that I just feel well, they, you, were, we they back, were just writing mysterious things she was doing. With I'm no gonna, plan I, in I'm their head. I'm going to get to that. I'm and, then, to, yeah, yeah, and then we find, and then we come, we come through, and we keep rolling through the chapters here, and we find out that she eventually kind of gets caught. We find out that uh, Savara's she was drawing a map on the back of the cave. Yeah. So oh, that that's the, what it was. Yeah. Oh, so okay. that the Kaleski yeah, could Laron, find her. Laron but called her out. I was I was drawing a map so that they could follow us, but my plan was to get the orb to safety all along. Yeah. I, what? Why, yeah, I, I, I don't know. But yeah, but yeah, then that doesn't end, even end up being a thing. I'm just thinking of this right now. Exactly. Yeah. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, what were you doing? You know what? Okay, I You were just goofing around in the back of the cave. I'm going to step out of universe for a okay. second and not pick... And, and I do know that this was book was written under a lot of pressure and a lot of time constraints. Yes, yes. And I'm going to say, I, I believe this about all of these books, the, these first three, is that there really wasn't... I don't... I can't believe that there really was an editor... Going, I know Weiss is an editor, but she was also writing. Yeah. So I don't know that there was really anybody that was going through this again with a fine tooth comb going, why did you write this? Let's cut this. Or why was this yeah. here? I think there's a lot of stream of consciousness stuff happening and things that are being written. Yeah, and that to, actually, to, as, to, as you say that, that bit with her in the back of the cave could have just been cut. Yeah, yeah. I, I, but, but, I feel uh, that yeah, these the suffer from yeah, not having yeah. probably a second or third look through and going, okay, what what were you doing here? What are you, you know, I, I feel that never happened. And as we get to the end of chapter seven here, yeah. as we get to the end of chapter seven and we keep rolling, I will say there is one phrase that I get to the end of chapter seven and I'm in. I'm in. I, I, I've Ooh. forgotten about everything else. I'm in. I want to go here. I want to find out what's going on. And that one phrase... Tumahuma. <laughs> Tumahuma. <laughs> Tumahuma. Hey, I want to go to the tomb. We've heard so much about Huma. Yeah. I, now we're, Let's oh get God, to this we're going to go to the tomb of Huma. 
I'm in. I want to go to the yeah. tomb of Huma. Okay, and they cross. Okay, throw this out or t explain this to me. They cross this white bridge over hot stream. You know, these steaming hot streams and stuff. What springs? Springs. The, yeah. The, the 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 bridge of passage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I don't understand is there's they try to elicit this feeling of danger about going over it, and I don't. I didn't ever really feel that. I'm like, well, it sounds like it's a really big white bridge. Why is I, are they gonna uh, fall there's, off? There's no handrails. Uh, okay, well, but how wide is this? <laughs> I, 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 in the moment, I wrote down. I feel like something is happening. Maybe they were going for mystery. I'm just confused. Yeah, I don't know. We do, and then they throw out weird things like, "Hey, Flint has heart trouble." <laughs> by the way, <laughs> you, you had, wait, and by had, the way, Flint's on a pacemaker. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, you hadn't picked that up from book one. Hey, be, well, yeah, no, I've, known, I've known that from book one. No, we, he keeps, <laughs> I know we know this, but I, they just—it's like they're constantly. This is where I'm feeling like... Hey, BT, BT dubs, the dwarf's tickers on the fritz. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, but it's kind of sometimes at weird times that it's thrown out in your... It, I it's almost like, like it. a light. I see, I feel like a light is being put on it. Like, yes. stuff's happening. Psst, Flint has heart trouble. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't, I don't like forget it. about Flint. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, he's with this party. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I like it because it tells us, again, it fleshes more out of Flint's character. And I like Flint as a character. I, like, I do like him as a I, character. I always hate it when you have characters that are too strong or too, and none of these characters have been too perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I hate it when you have that character that's like, okay, even a tertiary character is like, okay, oh, damn, Flint's got heart trouble. Right, right. Oh, oh, that's not a good thing right now. Flint is actually kind of old for a dwarf. Right. Yeah. And he's but, got heart trouble. Oh, God, no, not Flint. Yeah. You know what? But I, I feel we always just keep circling the same thing. Like, we want more character development and more fleshing out. We don't want them to flesh it out. This is the problem. This is why you don't write a book with this many characters. True. Is because yeah. you just have too many characters. You're trying to flesh them all out. You're fleshing out characters nobody wants to hear about. But then you're not fleshing them out enough. And we're worried, why aren't you fleshing them out more? You have too many characters. You, yeah. you just can't have this many characters. It's going to leave some but, people cold. So forget about the characters. Let's go to the tomb of yeah. Let's it, go to this tomb of all, all that does come from the origin of this. Hey, there's modules. Hey, let's make a book to sell it. Yeah, right. I get it. And it spawned, yeah, I, it spawned, oh, yes. it spawned a great world. But yes. we're in the tomb of Huma. We're now in the Tomb of Hoover. We enter it. Uh, okay, I'm going gonna, gonna to ask you, because now what I read on the page is getting conflated with what I'm looking at in comic books. Did you get the impression that this was a giant stone like wall carved with dragons? Or did you get the impression that it was actually shaped like a giant dragon? Right? Yeah. I think it's supposed to be shaped like a giant carved dragon, right? Because then that it said that Tass yeah. and Flint yeah. get in, or Tass and uh, Fizbin get into the neck of it. or yeah. so, so it's a giant carved dragon, which yeah. I think was cool. Well, a mountain carved into a dragon. Into a dragon, yes. which is cool. Which, which is, I don't know why it's a secret location if it's a mountain it's carved like in a mist. Dragon. mist. It's, it's, it's covered yeah. in mist and be, from the boiling springs that they have to walk over the bridge. <laughs> that were scary. They were scary. And I, well, and I look at my notes here, and I love and to go to get on Paul's boat here because Paul's always the one who's pointing out to what Taz does. I love that. The, <laughs> Taz I do too. I do too. Time. We're on this bridge. There's boiling springs around us. We're going to the Tumahuma. <laughs> And you just have this one line from Taz where he looks over the edge of the bridge and is like, I wonder if we could cook our dinner in there. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. That is good. Hilarious. Hilarious. So again, we go into this tomb. There's an obsidian casket in the middle, and there's this deep well. with You know, you're kind of setting up the module. This is the final module that is actually, like, kind of was written. They had to write about this is where we cut all ties. From here on out, there is no more modules. This is it right here. Like this is it. From this point on, Weiss and Hickman have caught up. They are they are writing and the modules must follow them. So we're setting up the wow. last module. Yes. Which cool. we get in the door. And this is such a cool thing for me because I like I like prophecy stories. Mm -hmm. I like prophecy stories, and so we get in the door of the Tuma Huma. We go through like we go through the the vestibule, the narthex, if you will. <laughs> the vestibule. <laughs> <laughs> we, go, we, we, we go through the narthex. We get to this next. We get to the next part of the tomb, and what's in the next part of the tomb? Massive sculptures of the entire massive ancient sculptures of, of the party. Yep. yep. And and I yeah, love that, that, that kind that, of stuff. That was weird. I it was weird. But I thought it was cool. Yeah, well, I thought so. And we, don't we find out that it's because they're worthy of entering that that's yes. why they see themselves? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. It was that, that it started with Raistlin. Mm. Mm. I'm yeah. like, that. I'm like, wait a minute. What has he been getting himself into? Like some sort of time travel? Yeah. yeah. 
Like, oh, weird you say that. <laughs> <laughs> don't you don't you two, don't you two spoil anything more. I'm not more. spoiling anything. I will come across this table. <laughs> Uh, That's how the podcast ends. Yeah, that, that was the, <laughs> now episode, just an hour of silence after that. Of <laughs> and we never got beyond episode four. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so chapter nine, the Kenders' startling discovery. Again, Silvar is being weird, <laughs> casts a spell for everybody to go to sleep, but the Kender uh, jumped behind and this a is shield. Me, this is me, I, I guess this is the part in my notes where I'm starting to remember what is going on. Um, why I don't think she's a dragon. Hmm. Um, the betrayal part is, they actually keep me going. I think this is the part of mystery that Weiss and Hickman are doing well. Right. Um, there's a lot of the mystery that they do where I'm just going like, I don't know. I feel like you're, you guys are just talking about stuff that I've never talked, like I've never heard about. <laughs> but right here, it's suspenseful. It's keeping me going. Right. And I'm actually, I'm thinking that the dragon orb possessed Silvara. That is where I'm at right now. Oh, that's what, a good read. Yeah, it. yeah. Whatever is in the dragon orb reached yeah. out and has. You her. know what? And I wouldn't be surprised if that's what they're going on it mm-hmm. uh, for. It. And I feel again, editor going through this would have been like, are you going for her being possessed? Let's cut this and add this. Yeah. And, and then it would work. That would have been a really good twist. Um, what I do like here, and you know what? Listening back to the last episode that we did, uh, when I was reading kind of the rundown, the synopsis of this, I went like, oh. And Fizbin. Yay. Like, I didn't like it. No, I, I should have read it the other way. Yeah. Uh, this, oh, Fizbin. I'm like, yes. yes. Fizbin is here. I do love that That there's this cool wind tunnel transport system uh, that Taz falls down. And when he gets to the end of it, <laughs> I love that, like, I love, like, the, am I dead? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> right, Taz's, yeah. like, childish like, mind, like. Is this death? Any, any <laughs> like, 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 he, like oh, he's sitting dead. on a like he's sitting on a bench in purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> any, anytime we go into Taz's mind, it is always Hilarious. funny, and it, it is good. It will always draw me back into the book, even yeah. if I'm losing it. Like, right. I will immediately draw me back. Yeah, right. it's, it's, it starts like like kind of like I don't know. It's like I got a little chuckle out of it, and then and then we get to the part where he finds Fizbin. And I am audibly laughing out loud. Right. Like yeah. I'm sitting alone in a in my living room, just <laughs> holding. Okay, just like just to like take this at face value. I'm holding paper bound together, sitting on a couch, laughing. <laughs> like I, I I have never laughed this hard at a piece of literature. <laughs> it was it's, it's in, good. A good way. Yeah, in a good in, way. In a good, in a good way. way. In, in yeah. like yes. the best way. This yeah. is the. Best part of once the again, Dragon Lance Chronicles. Once again, yes. Fizbin saves the day. You know? well, and, oh. and, and we get yes, Fizbin at the end of chapter nine here where they're sitting on the bench. It's, Tab, 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 you're Taz, and I'm, who am I? Yeah, who am I? Yeah, <laughs> who am I? Yeah. Fuzzbun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He keeps getting his name, name wrong. wrong. Yeah. yeah. There, there are times where even Fizbin uh, throughout ha- kind of rides the line of almost breaking the fourth wall. Oh, he definitely does. You know, and, and I does. like that. I really like the. He, hey, this is this is like Dragonlance's Deadpool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I didn't even think of it like that. Yeah, That's yeah. So yeah. Good. And I, for me, the twenty-one gun salute. Yes. Yeah. I was just <laughs> gonna bring as that soon up. As I heard that. I just started laughing. I'm like, I love that he just and yeah. And of course, Taz's response is, gun. Yeah, what? it's like, <laughs> like it's almost it's farcical, but uh, but I I, I like it. Um, so Silvara's secret, Fizbin and Taz go back to the chamber with the others, and Fizbin uh, again because he flashes to these moments of being serious, where he's not always just a doddering kind of clumsy, you know, half wit, I guess, uh, you know, or acting that way. I know there's more to Fizbin than meets the eye here. Then he talks to Silvara, and Silvara's crying and all this kind of stuff. So, what did well, you of course, I, we have a spell to get I them mean, back to the rest of the group that Fizbin it goes comically wrong. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's the Fizbin outside of episode 2.5 yeah. and what is revealed there about him. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah they there show is it, still yeah. I, I am just I'm dismissing that. Right. And I'm, I'm, it, it isn't true. It's just denial. No, no, no yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I I'm watching Empire Strikes Back and denying the prequels. That's what I'm doing right <laughs> yeah, now. yeah, right, yeah. right, right, right. Um except I, I guess I don't know how true the prequels in this case are. <laughs> um it's hilarious. 
He is right. so uh, he is so the, breaking the fourth wall, being the Deadpool of the series. So good. Yeah, I really like it. But unfortunately, he's not here long. So, uh, you know, chap- middle of chapter ten, he's gone. Fizbin leaves, and Silvara is revealed as being the dragon's sister <laughs> to the dragon who fell in love uh, with with Huma. And um, I like this because they fooled me. Because this is the point where it comes out. Yeah, my mind is blown, mm. and I. I love this idea. Yeah. I like the idea. Again, I feel it was poorly poorly hidden or, or veiled, but it uh, again, with some editing, I think it I, I, I really good. It, it fools uh, one out of four podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we do have this part here, too, where if you're paying attention, you know, Fisbin is left. Or, you know, Fisbin yeah, is, right, you, you got to tell him, what, you got to tell him what's going on. Right. And so Fisbin leaves, and of course Taz bounces back behind him, oh, wait, follows follows him off. Before he does, though, he's holding Flint's head in his hand, and he's like, Flint, what happened to you? And then Fisbin's like, hey, let's go. Okay, clink, and he just drops it. <laughs> <laughs> in one of the best, the best moments of this book. Yeah, yeah. And so when, so, la- so they leave yep. together. And so no, the, the, split, when, the when, split split party is split again. Yes, and so when Flint wakes up, the first thing is Flint's like, "Where's, where's the Kender?" <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, right. Uh, I don't. How do you lose the Kender? You were <laughs> yeah, supposed to yeah. be watching him. <laughs> and then there's, there's a good like uh, moment for him. Yes, yeah. I mean, it like, is. The he the Kender drives him crazy, but it's because he loves the Kender. Right? Exactly, and so I then, love that relationship. Then I kind of have this. Call me crazy. In my notes, I put call me crazy. I don't really see why Silvar and Gilthanis can't be together, but they cry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they always. Oh no, no! I thought I thought that was like that was that was foreshadowed in what uh, Fisbin was saying. Oh, you, oh, it is. You made a promise. Yeah, and, no. I, and I assumed the promise was you will not do what your sister did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do. I do think that's what we're we're led to believe there. Yeah, and I, I I do kind of understand why they can't be together, but again, I feel these ideas of relationships of people who can't be together is kind of being used with everybody. And it's just kind of the blank, yeah, it, it's kind it, of the blanket mode yeah. uh, that they're going with. It's like, hey, you know that Romeo and Juliet play was really popular. We're gonna give it to all our kids. Yeah, well, you like was... Romeo and Juliet. You're gonna love three Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If that lived forever, Dragon Lance will live forever. Forever if we put three of them in there. And we get to the end of what we get to the end of part two here. We get to the end of part two, Woo! and at the end of part two, we find out that the silver-haired chick who's been with us all the time just magically has the power to grant the iron to to, to, to grant the uh, blacksmith the ability to make dragon lances. Yeah. Why weren't we doing this before? You know, it's really good that we find out now since you gave away the hammer that can make dragon lances <laughs> willy-nilly to the dwarves. It was rent. <laughs> That, it, that no, is still the stupidest thing I've I'll, ever I, heard. I, I, will, I will oppose you, and I will oppose you adamantly. It makes sense. There's, It's been so long since they made a Dragonlance. Technology has progressed. Right. Dude has... Dude has robo arm, <laughs> and like you're, you're. Why, why are you getting hung, hung up on him? Like not needing a big hammer. Like no, no, no. no. <laughs> that's not. That's not necessarily what I'm saying. I'm okay. saying if okay. you're the characters, and it, you know, let's say these characters were real, right? And you, these characters are real. Okay, they are real. <laughs> and you're being faced, in my heart. You're being faced with this crazy army that's invading and attacking everything, and you've been given. Gosh, I can't get over this hammer, can I? <laughs> no, I'm still talking no, about this. Not at all. You have been given what you think is the only way to make like hammers. Three hours yeah. and 45 minutes later, you're still talking about I'm this still talking about hammer. I know. But you've been given the only thing that can make them, and then you're like, oh, for rent, for keeping these, like, few guys. We'll, we'll just Bob, give you this hammer. It speaks to the desperate. It's Bob, just the worst. Moment. It's just the worst. No! Bob, no. go home, <laughs> grab your nine-year-old daughter, sit on the couch, watch Frozen, and let it go. Nah, I'm not going <laughs> to let it go. Oh! 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 oh, oh. Well, that was good. But I, I just can't. Um, but no. So we get, we get down here, we find out we have the knowledge to make the drag. Dra- which I think is good. Which I, is good. Yep. Which well, is good. End of book two, vo- volume two. We got dragon lances. Hey. We now we now have dragon lances, which is good. Way to go, Theros. And, and with all that, we will barrel in to book three of volume two. Yes, the end.
Chapter one, the Red Wizard and his wonderful illusions. Hey, I've been wondering, what's up with Raceland? Hey, yeah, and good, crew? good news, yeah. Raceland's back. Raceland is back. Uh, we're at Port Balafor at the Pig and Whistle, owned by William Sweetwater. Um, great name for a innkeeper. Great name for a bar. I, I you know, I like. I, I, I would go to the. I would definitely go to the Pig and Whistle and have a drink from Mister Sweetwater. Oh, and I love <laughs> the fact that they call him Piggy <laughs> because he, like he fell and his nose is kind of piggish and stuff. This is fun. I like this. Just the entire description of this area just kind of made me like. I'd be willing to hang out there for a little while. Right. Other Again, than the draconians. This is one of those times. They, they tipped us off in, in the annotations anyway that this is where uh, finally the last vestiges of the baggage of the of the modules has been dropped. And I feel like, hey, uh, I almost feel like the writing even changes here. Again, I would love there to be a version where uh, Weiss and Hickman's individual writing is outlined in different colors to see what who did what and who wrote what. But even Definitely. The, the writing feels different uh, here for some reason. I don't, I don't know what it is. But initially, the feeling I get here, uh, I'm liking. So uh, we have Raceland, Etanis, and Riverwind, Love Moon. I'm just going to put them together as one. They're always together. <laughs> they're always together for me because uh, they're they, in love. They, well, that's true. Yeah, but they're also the couple that has the joint Facebook page. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It feels like it should almost be a joke. So Raceland, Tennis, Riverwind, Love Moon, Caraman, and Tika walk into a bar. <laughs> like, and there should be some sort of punchline. Um, they, there, there, there is a punchline. <laughs> <laughs> there is a punchline because Raceland does magic. That's true. So they need to get to. Sand Crist, right? So, so they because they have a dragon orb. They have a dragon orb. They've been They're lying they, low, you're right? They say that they need to get to Sand Crist. Um, do they have a plan to get there? No. No, they're, no. They're, they're pulling a Paul, and they are coming up with a plan on the spot. <laughs> they're coming up with a plan on the spot. It's so far. <laughs> yeah. So far, it's worked. <laughs> yeah. Raceland's going to do some magic tricks. Tika's going to dance almost naked. Raceland is literally going to do magic tricks. He's going to do yeah. magic tricks. Uh, and, of course, you're going to use Tika for, I guess, the only thing she's been pushed into the series to do, which is just be curvy. So she's going to dance uh, almost naked. And, and you, know, it's, you know it's been a while since we had... A song. A song. <laughs> so, <laughs> Gold Moon Lovejoy is going to sing her new hit off the the Sh Sunny and Cher album. <laughs> and I love the fact. I love uh, the off disc one of the Misha Call series. <laughs> Dis I <laughs> the discs of Misha Call. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and I love the fact that we we go through this and everybody we go through this description of everybody's special skills and then we get the Caravan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So pretty much I have this, okay, this is where things start to get kind of, I, I hate this because I love this, I, I kind of love, here's where I think there's a problem between what the sensibilities of a gamer would be and what the sensibilities uh, of a novelist honestly would be. If you're a person who's really into gaming, this is a Great scenario. Your friends all show up, you're the DM, and you're like, you know what would be freaking awesome if we're all in a inn and in a tavern and you gotta do your magic tricks and like it's a something for everybody to do in the party and whatever. And as a gamer, this is gonna be awesome. From a storyline aspect, you have got a dragon orb, Tannis. Okay, <laughs> like you've had uh, wait, other things, okay. What is your plan? You're not going to hide. Uh, you have no other ways of making money, yet later on in the chapter we'll find out how they get money by not performing. Okay? And you're just going to, like, have Tika perform, and, raise, and, and obviously people are going to do magic, and you're going to be high profile and not low profile. Instantly I'm going... What are you doing? I just wrote whatever because I'm going to try to have fun with this and not let it ruin my experience with logic. Okay, it's a D and D thing. <laughs> your party had your. Party. I just said it was a D and D thing. I said you are a gamer. That is why you would like this. Is because you can see yourself as a DM going. I've invented something for all of you to do yes. at the table tonight. And yeah, every, I get it. And we know now that everybody's in the party. Because we go through this description of everybody's skills and the singing and the dancing right. and the caramel on Power Beach lifting things. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> and yeah. The, the, the only problem I have with the skill thing is people are paying money to have Tennessee in the dark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which, on the other hand, like you said, if you're trying to keep a low profile... Isn't that kind of showing off your elfin blood? Right. Yeah, let's just point out that you're an elf. Hey, you can see in the dark. Well, and another or, thing or, that... Or is that, or is that the bit that he's... In, they don't know he's an elf. 
And he can see in the dark. Yeah, okay. I know, but don't it, isn't it always reference to how his almond eyes always give him away? Uh, yeah, I I think it's like nodded like oh some people like I mean, some I mean people you get know it. it's, it's somebody doing sleight of hand in right. uh in the park you know right. it's most people are falling for it but those people are like come on man but again sometimes I, I i don't get the feel for what they're going for all the time because you have again it seems like all these books are going with the every culture is really isolated and hates each other yet they're all just interacting all the time and and you know like like this is like a cross section of every culture right now uh, in Crin traveling around together, you know, and and yet nobody's calling it out. So I'm feeling like, well, this is a pretty liberal culture. They're all just kind of, you know, towns are used to having elves and kenders and everybody and dwarves. Everybody's around, yet everybody still hates each other and doesn't want to work with each other. I'm not getting like it's like there's two vibes going here, and I don't know what do you so want in this I, world. I got and it I, as the. Lords, the rulers don't like each other, but the common folk, they don't care. They just want to have fun. Mm. That's what I read it as. Yeah, a bit, Paul, a bit of Paul for me. but yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's just my stretch that I went with, where it was just one of those where I, I really like this as it showed the common folk going, okay, anybody that doesn't like our oppressors, we like them. So right. whether they're elf, dwarf, kinder, I don't care. And Paul, I completely agree with you on that. And this was also showed to me how there is a disjointment in the High Lord's armies as well. Because th they're actually making money off so off a bunch of the High Lord's soldiers right, who are coming right. to this show. And We're back to stupid draconians who don't know really what's going on. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so it showed that hierarchy and, okay, the invading army isn't even perfect. Right. But again, I'm always going from the idea. I, I feel like I constantly think of this as... You have a dragon orb. This is really big. Proceed now with extreme caution. And Tannis, like always, has no freaking clue what to do. And he's just like, hey, I like this idea of a, of a show. Because his idea is that if they get popular amongst the Draconians... This was weird. They'll make enough money that they can now freely move around. So your idea is to become like this super circus rock act that the draconians will love so much like i guess you could say you're going to hide by being so out there no one would ever suspect suspect you of having a dragon lance but here is my big problem is all you need to do is get on a ship and get to sand crest cuz from my understanding they're all harbor towns how much money does it really take to get on a ship and move like so your plan is to get so big that you're going to make enough money to buy a, a a trailer, you know, like a yeah. wagon and all the stuff. Then Tika's going to have outfits, and you're going to travel around, and you're going to get really big. Like, is that a part of the disguise? I to See, me, it's just like you lay low and do what they do later on in the book. You just go knock a couple heads together, take some money from them, <laughs> get on a ship, shut up, and get to San Chris. To be to that's be, not very good D and D playing, but that's logically what you do. Maybe hijinks and sue on the sea. You get captured by people, like stuff that would happen in a, like a like a regular storyline where your characters are doing what's logical and and circumstances happen to them instead of your characters like Tannis do something. Completely Completely illogical. I have the key, and we're just going to go high profile and do a song and dance act. This, to me, is ridiculous. But, Bob, have you ever bought tickets for a group of people? Remember, we've got, like, eight people in the party. That's got to be expensive to buy tickets. <laughs> that's true. That's to, buy, uh, to buy tickets for a ship. To buy tickets to, to buy tickets to go somewhere. Right. But that seems to be undermined by later on, where they, they have spent all of their money on show stuff and tents and wagons and stuff, and then they just kind of don't really have a lot of money, and then they kind of, like, knock some heads together, and then they have enough money to buy passage, which we'll get to. I don't know. It just feels like this is inserted here to be cool, because this is what people want to see, like, haha, Raceland's doing magic tricks, haha, Tika's dancing, wanted to see that. You know, like that kind of stuff. It's fun. I'm having fun reading this, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, but this doesn't make see, sense. This and, is not what I'd write. And for me, in the back of my mind, because of how I've read books, I do not know which one came out first. The Wheel of Time series. They have a period of time where they do something similar and in my mind, in this book, that was what I saw. Anybody that has read the Wheel of Time series probably know what I'm talking about. Right. And that was what I saw, was what was going on in my mind when I read that book. So I loved this. Where right. It brought me back to that book 
a book that I love. Right. Yeah, what I've but nobody about. had problems with why they're doing it or the fact that they're not trying to be secretive about having a dragon arm. Because I feel, character-wise, this is fun. Like, I yeah. like seeing my characters doing this, but underlying that, your motivations for why this is happening make no sense. I feel you could tweak this and make it make sense, well, but it doesn't on the page as it is. What I've got here is, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say I'm right there with you, Bob. Okay. I'm torn. Uh-huh. This, yeah. This is like, it's it's weird that it's here, but I'm enjoying it. Mm-hmm. But then I'm like, well, logically, why are they doing this? But what I'm getting is right. they need money. Yeah. They right. need money and they need a distraction. And it, it is talked about more, you know, why it is so expensive to get on a ship. Right, right. Um, But it's, I, I don't, it, it could have done without the chapter, but I enjoyed it. Um, it you know what it's I a like good here? way to give Storm some stuff. Stir- storm, storm some story. <laughs> right. What I what I like here is, Klob, you were totally right. Uh, in Dragons of Autumn Twilight, you were like, so can there be interspecial dating between draconians and things? Once again, Tika, object of desire. It said the the draconians especially like to watch her dance. <laughs> so uh, you know, I guess draconians are attracted to human women. So I guess uh, that could happen. Well, and then we jump here, and then we keep moving throughout the chapter, and we have it just kind of end th- this portion of them doing the magic tricks and doing the show just kind of ends and then all of a sudden we are as you said in um wait can i just say a giant crowd cheers them as they leave i just have <laughs> wtf i mean come on I, I don't know if you're with whatever a giant that's crowd a bit, cheers that's them. a bit much it's kind of disney channel yeah a little bit well again low profile tennis you idiot and the entire town is cheering I'm like there they go with their wagon <laughs> i will say the the entire time that they were that they were doing this performance. They never talked about having the dragon arm. They were pretty secretive about having the dragon arm. It's true. Arm. No, that's true. They're being secretive in the open about it. It's like Led Zeppelin's doing a world tour and they've got a nuke with them. Nobody yeah. knew. Yeah, okay. nobody knew. <laughs> so I want to go back to when you, because when we talked about Ra- Rast, I keep, whenever I do Caramon, I always call him Rast. I know it's Rast, right. but it's Rast. And, uh, and I like that. I actually like that you but, do that. Uh, whenever I go back to Rast in his weird caravan with the creepy stuff going on. I don't know. All the weird things that race did. I know... I thought it was pretty cool how they included the dragon orb into this, but he was being very secretive. Yeah, I, I, what did, what did you I, I, I like this struggle with the dragon orb. Obviously, we did this as a stinger at the beginning. I, I like I like it. Yeah. It's dark. It's, Again, when you're setting up dark and you're setting up kind of this whole uh, mythology for the land, I, I like it. I like this kind of stuff. Yeah, and Raceland is one of the strongest characters in this book. Right. He is always up to something. He has always got an ulterior motive. Right. Which which might be why the fans love him so much. Yeah, I got an idea. What you should do is create a trilogy of books that focuses just on Caramon and Raceland. Oh, <laughs> oh wait, wait, you're going to do that. Because that is your strongest stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I like what happens in there. We got kind of some... Uh, kind of thing going on between Caramon and Tika, where Tika like really has it bad for Caramon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the fourth. <laughs> this is the fourth denial of love. Or I'm hearing the cock crow. <laughs> Like, like, man, uh, Tika, I'm in love with you, Tika, and Karaman just constantly denying you. This I mean, is this give is me a just, call, Tika. just building into what gave me the feels and Sylvanesti. Is yes. Karaman's we'll devotion s- to his brother. Oh, yes. He will take yes. it for his brother. I mean, he will. Uh, you have Tika, who literally who's described died. as being, uh, you know, a very desirable woman, and and is, illustrated as a uh, beautiful woman in the '80s. Uh, yeah, beautiful '80s woman, feathered and, hair and all. One of, I think, one of the singers for the Runaways. I'm not. Sure, but <laughs> and, and, and on the other side too, Caramon's a pretty decent looking, big buff dude. Exactly, and the, the, this is actually one of the only relationships uh, I want to see go somewhere. It's the like you said, Club, the football player and the cheerleader. Bob, hey, for I, sure, I like this though, and I want this to go somewhere. And I, like you said, Luke, this is so strong that he will keep denying her because he feels he his pull to Raceland is so strong that he needs to take care of his brother, and it would. Detract from that. And I, I like it. I like how they add a little bit of mystery. And yeah, I know we talked that about how there are three books about Caramon and, and Raslin. Right. Raslin. But I like how it just adds a little bit of mystery. If these were the first books that you were reading, it would make you make some assumptions. Things like that. Yeah, and right. I, I think that's why this is always recommended as the entry point. 
Yeah. Yes. yes. No. Uh, and, we, and we have in this whole Tika Karaman exchange, Karaman slips. Oh, he does. And Karaman yeah. slips and share. And so we see that Karaman cares for her because he actually slips mm -hmm. and gives her some information that he's not supposed to tell anybody else about the high, tr the high, tr the trials and the towers of high sorcery. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. I would just like to point out here that. Again, looking over my notes, looking at your notes, Bob, looking at your notes, Luke, looking at your notes, Paul, I would like to say that I was right. The trials take place before we ever get to Karaman's Pledge. So there we go. Let's jump back to him, the nice trials. Um, yeah. Sturm goes to trial for not following Derek's orders to attack the elves. Um, and there's lots of courtroom stuff. You know, mm. yeah. yeah. Uh, for some I reason, actually, this stuff's not really doing it. Oh, it, it, it did it for me. Well, I, I, I guess are, are we in the part where it's the actual trial? Um, well, there. I, I just have written. Honestly, in my notes, I have written. There's lots of courtroom stuff. Yeah. But in yeah. the yeah. end, so this, Lord this, Gunth this. Lord Gunther places uh, him third in command of the army sailing to Palafax. Yeah, Fest. yeah. Th this, this is the part. I, yeah. I don't know why. I just had this vivid imagery in my head of what was going on right. and how this was really explaining Sturm at this point wasn't just the annoying lawful good character in the campaign. Right. He there's a reason for it. He does have morals and it's because the Knights of Salomnia are so corrupt yeah. and it's all about politics. And maybe it's because it's 2017 and <laughs> I live in America. I don't know why this is resonating with me so much, yeah. but I I had so much fun reading about this. This was almost the part that I wanted us to do for the intro for this episode. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, we had debated this. Uh, here's the thing for me, what I what I think, Luke, is that I, I don't mind this part. I feel we're starting to get close to th some things feeling out of place. Like, we're in book two. I, I feel like things should be ramping up to something a little bit more action-filled. Again, we've got a long time, I feel, without anything that, you know... I mean, we're having invasions of dragons. I'm not getting any really great large-scale action battles, anything like that. We're, again, very character-focused, which I can't believe I'm saying is kind of sometimes a negative thing. Usually in books I'm going, hmm, not enough character development. Uh, I think we're overdoing it on that, and sometimes at the detriment of world building and, and what's going on in the larger scale of things. Uh, we're staying down on the D&D &D table and not take pulling back for a bigger view. And so I feel like some some of this stuff just doesn't feel like it's resonating with me. Well, and I, I like the courtroom scene. I like the introduction of Gunther. Yes, we're, we're, yeah, we're, I like we're, Gunther. we're introducing yeah. a new character, but everybody besides Sturm, all of the actual real knights that we've met so far, have not lived up to this code that we were out. We've been told for a book and a half mm -hmm. now. And Derek was not the code. No, and yeah. and so we get this introduction of Gunther, who is older and is you know basically standing in as you know one of the judges over Sturm when Derek's accusing Sturm of not listening to him and not following his orders. But Gunther actually is trying to do the right thing, mm -hmm. and. In doing that, he actually plays with the law a little bit, and I kind of really liked the little bit of playing with the law. I feel the scenes went on way too long here, right? but yeah. I liked the outcome, and I liked the feel that I got that, oh, okay, not all the Knights of uh, Salomnia that are left are like Derek. There's right. actually right. people who are still trying to uh, trying to Very live up to the few. code. Right. Very yeah. few. Right. And Derek's actually Which quite... Which is cool. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You right. know, and I think you're striking on some club that... Uh, there's parts in here where I feel like this is a good storyline, and because we have so many characters, again, some of this you could almost split into multiple books, right? right. Like, 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 I, yeah, I, I feel like this would be, this is good stuff uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, but because we've been spending our time with other things, I mean, we got a Silvara love story going on and everything else. It hasn't been given always the time it probably should have, so that by the time we get here, it feels tacked in instead of kind of like in the plot. Like, it's not, right. like, a good, like, I'm, flow I'm, here. I'm sorry. I read through this, and it was hard. It was hard for me to really? read through it. I, I cannot believe we're on opposite I, sides yeah. right now, Paul. I know. <laughs> normally, normally we're on the same yeah. side about things well, like well, this. Well, I mean, but you're, you're in favor, and I am like, what is wrong with this? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I just really could not get into this court scene. 
Yeah. The, the yeah. final verdict did it for me. The final verdict made the, the the writing of Gunther and the writing of Gunther's ultimate plan when we get to this mm-hmm. final verdict made slogging through the other stuff worthwhile because right. it was a great power move. Right, right. By Gunther. Yeah. To okay, we're going to strip Caramon down. We're going to take all of his stuff his dad's stuff away from him, his dad's title. Beautiful. He was never a knight anyways. Um but oh yeah, by the way, Derek, you don't have anyone to back up your story either. Yeah. So we're actually going to make we're actually going to make Sturm a lesser knight. Right. But you guys are going to go do this stuff, and you're going to be in joint command to prove who's the better man. Right. I do like Gunther, and it, yeah, you're right. It puts Gunther him in a really good, good position. I, I like it. So then we can maybe from this point then skip on down to chapter four. We're back at Lord Gunther's house. I I love this. Anytime Fizbin shows up, Fizbin and Tass show up at Lord Gunther. Uh, Pull back the curtain. This was the third scene that we talked about possibly doing as the intro. Mm-hmm. Um, again, any strong scene we like to try to do. Um, I love this stuff. This is funny, comedic. Out of nowhere, too. It's kind of out of yeah. nowhere. I feel like all of Fizbin Tass stuff oh, feels yeah. like out of nowhere. Yeah. Like it's kind of like it sideswipes you, but it's always pleasantly sideswiped. And I think that's why I like it. Is it is out of nowhere and it's yep. comedy. When I think of yep. comedy, I don't want to be able to predict it. I want it to be surprise. Yeah, and there, there's I mean like, I'm I'm excited initially. We get um Fisman and Tannis, they're showing up or Tannis Fisman and Tass, they're showing up. I'm excited about it. But then all of a sudden we get like a lesson in gnomish history about yeah. Mount Nevermind. Yeah, because the orb is there, right? He yeah. sent the orb to Mount Nevermind. I mean, no. Gunther has taken the orb and is like, let's go. Again, I guess we find out that there are at least two races working together, uh, I, right? I, you know, and that the, the Salamnic Knights are able to I guess. work with the I, gnomes. I, I'm, just, I'm just at this point in this, this part of the book where it's jumping around like crazy. Mm-hmm. We're following too many characters yeah. and things. That, I mean, and that's why. I, I like the idea of keeping them separated by like parts of the book, but now we're just going back and forth, back and forth. Right. And... Right. I'm not really a fan. I of actually like the fact that it's a little vague here in yeah. the beginning at Gunther's yeah. house. It's we're at Gunther's house. Gunther's there, and they they don't name Fizbin and you. We know it's Fizbin and Taz, mm. but we do have this confusing moment with Gunther going, "Who's the wizard in the Kinder?" Yeah, yeah, that yeah, just right, walked, right, right, in, just right. walked okay, into and, my and, house. And, and Gunther has his uh, manservant who is super <laughs> suspicious of Kenders and is like just watching Taz the whole time. Right, right, mm. yeah. Uh, there's a little behind the scenes here because we're going to get to the gnomes in uh, Mount Nevermind and it, it did say in the annotations that the gnomes in D&D were a hard race to play. I guess back kind of in the 80s people didn't like gnome, playing gnomes. Gnomes are still a hard still race a hard to race. play. They're so still a very hard race It says that they were illusionists. Correctly. They could talk to animals but I, I don't know. What, for whatever reason people didn't like playing them uh, and Jeff Grubb uh, said that he decided to make them engineers for this book. Like change them up. I love this. I, I play Magic the Gathering and, and gnomes tend to be you know yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot of this kind of idea yeah, with, okay. you know, okay. where they're kind of engineers and yeah. they build stuff and I, maybe they, they took it from here. I don't know where um, but but I like this, and so we get into chapter five where we're we're going to Mount Nevermind, and this amazing illustration of a gnome flinger. Yeah, yes. Y- yes. You know, I I have to say I love this chapter. Um, it's it's silly, and you know the gnomes are talking in large long sentences, and they're throwing people Can around. I, which, I which which doesn't it really sound like a derogatory name for something, Luke? Or a derog- you gnome flinger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I won't I want to point out. I love the gnomes, and I love how they talked about how the gnomes just speak so quickly that no human can really understand them. Right. I love that that it was subtle, and it right. was hard to read when I tried to read through it. But then it's, I love that. Yep. I I I hated this. Really? <laughs> the best part of this chapter was the illustration. But yeah, you know, wow. we're always usually on the same side, Luke. This, okay. This is, <laughs> yeah. the, I love this. I, it it sucks. I don't know. This, I'm with you, Paul. This, I'm, this, I'm glad Paul's with you. This, <laughs> this is here. ruining the pacing for me. We have all this like yeah. tension building up. Let's talk about gnomes. They're funny. You know, or let's talk about gnomes who speak in a language that when it's written in English on a piece of paper, I can't read. I you love that. Oh, I loved it. Oh, yeah, I, I, it couldn't, I, I couldn't, it was like, I would stop and I would take time to read it and be like, why? They have nothing notable to say. I love, why would I read See, it? I yeah. love the language. I love the fact that we're, I, I, I liked how this fleshed out the actual race. Um, I've played D&D with people trying to play gnomes numerous times and they, I, I 
it's, it's such a hard character yeah. to play that I actually I, I I understood it here when we got this little history of Nevermind. I understood it. I liked the. Yeah, what was it? No gnome. No gnome has ever actually completed a sentence. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, you know what it is. That, I think, that, that is a good idea. I, I think for me, a lot of the times with this book, I've always had so many issues with it that it's almost like I'm drowning in the water, and each chapter is like an iceberg coming by, and whatever's a good one, I'm grabbing onto. I don't care. I'm with you, Luke. That sometimes yeah. these are not flowing. This is not pacing and, well. And, 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 and but no, like. no flingers. I'm just like taking now each chapter as a isolated unit and going. Well, I had fun here. Well, like, <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, gnome flingers are uh, a replacement for stairs. It's a fun idea. Yeah, but this is not the place in the book to talk about this because yeah. well, you're building towards your climax of it your is. darkest I, the book? pacing yeah, of this well, last yeah. the pacing of this last book is awful i would have skipped this and i almost did skip this you chapter. know why because this is empire strikes back and ewoks just showed up <laughs> that that's why yeah. and you're flinging them around you you got these weird contraptions flinging people around a mountain uh interior i get it i don't know i just for whatever reason had fun i think because this book a lot of times skews for me is a lot of times we're so heavy handed and then people are just pouring their heart guts out to everybody and everything else it feels really heavy a lot of the times and I have always felt it plays best when it's really light mm -hmm. and fun and, and happy I think it's best when it's at, in that Jim Henson level of like you know this could be played by Muppets and right here I'm like seeing this as like some sort of giant labyrinth Muppet scene I'm like yeah this is about where the tone of these books should be at and it's kind of crazy throwing Muppets around and Bob if you think about it the, actually too you look at the gnome flinger and yeah. okay you've established the gnomes as engineers well, what's an engineer going to do? Engineer has 13 fail safes for when things go wrong. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. That, that was cool. I but wanna, not the place in the book. For I want to point this out. I, I, if they did this to any other character, I would have hated it. Yeah. But with Tass and Fizbin, I loved it. Can, right. can, can I counter that with gnomes are short? Yes. Yeah. So Fizbin sits in a short chair <laughs> where his... Probably the back of the chair comes up to about middle spine. And then... <laughs> and then Inertia is uh, like brought into the equation. His, I mean, like I. Okay, don't the, bring science into fantasy. I, 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 I am going to bring science into fantasy because the only thing that I'm thinking about right now is a catapult launching an old man and his spine just going snap <laughs> and him dying. That that is, I mean, that that is yeah. my, that is my brain. I right. work, I work in IT. I have right. a very logical mind, and this is my hang up here. There is a redemptive quality to this chapter with Fizzman at the end, where he becomes. Serious Fisbin. Well, then why weren't you siding on me with with me on Tannis and his cockamamie plans? <laughs> <laughs> there is no logic to anything he's because, come up because with. Because so I far. I like there is like there's I like that I like that he is everybody just thinks that oh my god Tannis always knows what to do and but in Tannis's mind he doesn't know what to do. See, no, no plan is the way to go. Guys. No, I I I do agree and I I think that's no. good if even the plans were kind of half baked. <laughs> But I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. Tannis is fumbling his way around. Fizbin at the end becomes serious Fizbin. And this is a really cool part. Yeah. If it hadn't been ruined for me in the cartoon that we watched in episode <laughs> 2.5, I would have enjoyed this much more. I've been like, wait a minute. There's mystery to Fizbin. Yeah, right. But right. I agree. Uh, anyway, it's... The pace of this is all wrong. So anyway, it's they, fun, but it's all wrong. They end up with the dragon Orban, and Fizbin says it's got to be taken to the Council of Whitestone, and the you know because the orb is still active. Um, I'm thinking of this is like the Palantir from <laughs> Lord of the Rings. You know, we're gonna take it. And we're gonna talk about it. Um, so we go to the Council of Whitestone. Oh, good. A council meeting. Yay. A council meeting. That's always a good thing to set up as and you're me, reaching your climax of your book. And by, all, um, and by all means, give me four paragraphs describing the day in December that this council meeting takes place. <laughs> was it four? I think I fell asleep. I thought it was like two pages. I am. I, I pa so Pacing, pacing, uh, pacing. So what for is a bunch, going on? A bunch of societies who cannot get along together, I guess they still meet every once in a while at a giant white stone to talk about stuff. I don't know. Nothing is really said about how they called this meeting together or, you know, did it take months mm -hmm. for this to assemble or whatever. The time just gets thrown out the window. I don't know what's going on here. But uh, the elves say that they're going to take it this this orb yeah. or it's going to be war things get bad uh fizbin taz and the guy which we didn't talk about nosh 
who is the the, the their gnomish guy. Their little gnomish guide oh, oh. who shows up, right? They oh, yeah, all because he wants to like uh, it's his destiny. It's his gnomish destiny. Yep. So yeah, so Nash show up. Taz breaks the orb on the white stone. Okay, this was my first thing. This entire chapter is loaded with problems for me. Taz comes and just kind of like I'm Tasselhoff and breaks the orb. I don't really know there, why there, there, he does. There's a this. moment before that when Fizbin talks and when he's being dark Fizbin. Yeah. Um, where he's talking about there's a choice that has to be made. Right. The white path or the dark path. And T- Tass, unknowingly, is the one who has to make that choice. And that right. right there with the dragon orb is the choice. Right. But this entire chapter is just... I don't know. It was <laughs> it was cool uh, because we finally got a dragon lance at the end of it. You know what? It was a lot of struggling through. I would have much rather read about how Theros forged a dragon lance. You know what? Nothing... Here's what, what I have. This problem right here is... A, or this chapter right here is a big kind of tipping point in some ways for me where I'm going, okay, this should be, okay, if chapter six of book three is where you're going to bring everybody together and maybe make some sort of plan or whatever, and this is going to launch you into your final stage of this, of this second book where, you know, all the good stuff is going to happen. Okay. So Taz breaks this thing again. I guess I kind of get Fizbin saying this, but again, I've always had problems with these, these orbs and hammers and everything else that they get and then just seem to not treat w- the way they should. I-, I don't get what the end point here is with him breaking this. As far as he knows and everybody else knows, this is how you control dragons. I don't know why somebody didn't kill him on the spot. No, but I'll tell you what, Bob. I understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I understand where you're going with this. One of the things that I looked at, looked here is nobody listens to the Kender. Yeah, everybody ignores the Kender. Everybody, nobody under, nobody's even taking this. They're a race that has a stake in this as well. True, and they're just like, well, screw you. You're a Kender. You don't know anything. And so there's this, there's this point here with Taz breaking it, and everybody just stopping and looking at him. And granted. I understand why the hell didn't somebody stab him. Yeah, right, right. But yeah. this Taz gives a little speech. Yeah, Saturday morning special style. Yes, <laughs> I liked it. Oh, I, I it. liked I, it. I liked Taz. You, we had serious Fizbin. Yes, we yep. take very we take serious Fizbin seriously because it's so out of character for him. Serious Fizbin is serious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All of a sudden, we have Taz, who even in the darkest depths of this book so far has been bouncing around going, hey, a cool new adventure. That's true. Who who finally gets serious and steps up and goes, you never listen to the Kender. You never listen to anybody else. We're all about to die. We need to stop fighting amongst ourselves. So I'm going to destroy the only (laughs) thing that can kill dragons. It's the only (laughs) thing. You idiot. Well, well, (laughs) it was a moment to unite the races. Exactly. Exactly. But, uh, okay, I I don't don't agree with Klaus. This, This this would not have worked. No, 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 no. Here's the thing. You have all of the races gathered together who believe you have now the dragon orb. With, but think about this. This is like getting Britain and America and, and everybody together saying, we now have a nuke. We're going to use this, and everybody's fighting over who is going to use the nuke. And Italy step... Okay, it wouldn't have been Italy. <laughs> hey, we've got a lot of listeners in Australia. Australia <laughs> steps up and is like, uh, yeah, I'm going to... I'm just going to destroy this right now. Everybody would be looking at him like, you, what, what did I, you just do? The only weapon to stop Hitler you just destroyed. This Kender would have been killed at in, this point. In, in your he would have, he would have... This would not have solved any problems. This whole council meeting would have devolved into destruction. Oh, in at your this point. scenario, it did. they know how to use a dragon orb. That's true. This, this, is, a, this is a mystical glass Nobody knows ball. how nobody knows how to use this, and it did descend into a bit of chaos after Tannis' Saturday morning special. People should have been died I in this say, chaos. I, and, I lo- and I love the scene of <laughs> I love the scene of how the chaos was broken up. Yeah. Paul, is that where you were going? Well no, I was saying okay. I one hundred percent agree with Bob. Honestly, as much as I love Tass, he should have died there. That should have been his big moment of oh. he, he, uni- he unites oh, everybody action. together, and then he, but he is still and killed. in his death, that's what stops that, them all. That is what I was thinking was going to happen. I'm more for that. Was okay. He he breaks the orb, and then 
somebody stabs him. And that person does end up, you know, it's it's just one of those where he's that martyr that will unite right. everybody. And to compile things that are problems for me, it's like at this point that Theros Ironfeld shows up from nowhere. Oh, I love this. Thro- this is stupid. Throws, I love this. Throws a dragon lance and shatters the white stone. I'm sitting there going, so... So what's the point here? Like, he he shows up. To me, this is Weiss and Hickman saying, I know what are cool visuals, okay? Like, I'm going to have the littlest person destroy the dragon orb. People are going to start fighting, and then we're going to have the Dragonlance guy come in and, like, wham, destroy the white stone. Visually, this is all going to look cool. But if you look at... I will. St- Why is the white stone shattered? Why is he just whipping dragon lances around? Again, everything should have devolved into chaos. All I can think of, this is Weiss and Hickman trying to say something about the Cold War. Okay, the dragon orbs are analogies to nuclear weapons. Gunther is Gorbachev, who is like, he's all cold and following a rigid system like the Russians. The Salamnic Knights, the Speaker of the Sun is Ronald Reagan, okay, because we're the arrogant Americans who know it all. And Taz is for nuclear disarmament armament. Okay, Bob. Bob, I, I actually I have a I have That's a, all I can think. I this is a political I, 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 80s statement about Reagan. I, I, this I, is I, what this is. And Theros Ironfeld comes and destroys the White House. This is all I can think. Bob, is what is going Bob, on. Bob, I, I can get you an ice pack because I know you stretched really far to get that metaphor. <laughs> um, but I, I I the Theros thing is dumb. <laughs> I will, st- I will stand by that adamantly. Yeah. It's the, done because it looks ta- cool. The Taz thing mm-hmm. is a character moment. Mm-hmm. It is expanding upon this childish race, this Kender who's just, oh, hey, I found this thing. To like, wait a minute, I have morals. And showing up these ancient elves, that that's where I'm sitting here. But again, what, what I said earlier, I would have rather read about Theros forging a dragon lance yeah. than this freaking council meeting. Luke, yeah. I, Luke, I will give you Theros forging a dragon lance. However, Theros coming in. And I'll raise you. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you're too young. Paul, you're too young. Bob, go with the visual on me here for a moment. Okay, I'm going with the visual. I'm trying to visualize. Oh, I, this, I, already know, I already know where you're going. This yep. is the Apple computer 1984 yeah. ad. Yep. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, my God. That, yes, that, that chick is. running through the movie theater hurling. <laughs> The, the no, wait, 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 wait. Clob, you nailed it. Yes. That is like from 84? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I mean, this I, book was written in 85. That is exactly what they did. They I, ripped I, off <laughs> that Apple commercial. And I, I know, I, I know how to, I, I, I'm an IT guy who manages Mac yeah. computers. I'm a Mac fan. I've, I know that commercial. Yes, I know what that you're is saying. exactly. Everybody's, what they, everybody's zombieing out. Everybody's not doing uh, what they're supposed to do. She comes in, breaks it. She comes in, whips it across, breaks, ev- oh breaks everything, God. and all of a sudden we can all be human again and we can I all hope, be connected. I you I, are. You <laughs> nailed that. I, I, I don't care I hope, what hope, anybody else ever says. Right. For the rest of my life, I'm going to believe. I that, hope. I hope you're not right. That White, <laughs> White Center or Hickman were watching TV and were like, I know how to end this. Chapter. I need, this, <laughs> I need to watch that commercial. Go look it up. Yeah, yeah. I'll show it to you. you all right. Right. Did you watch yeah. Futurama? A little bit. <laughs> okay. I guess yeah. If you definitely watched Futurama, you would have. They they, they um uh they, they did a spoof on it. Okay. Right? It was okay. very periodic. Yeah. Okay. Very so periodic. again, I mean, I'm having a lot of like kind of real world problems with this. I know I really stretch things at the White House or <laughs> anything like that. <laughs> I will but, say that was a beautiful but, speech on your. You know what? Off. Here's the here's the reason though. A lot of for this is because Weiss and Hickman are not good about hiding where they're getting a lot of their stuff from. The entire times that I've been reading this book, I know they are pulling from pop culture. They're, they're, I know, a, what, a, Hick, little, a little Drax the Destroyer. Yeah, Hickman is blatantly metaphor. ripping ripping things from the Bible and everything else hoping like I hope nobody's read the Old Testament because I'm pulling names and everything from it right like so I know he is they are both using I mean they have been tasked with an unenviable thing create a novel to tie in a bunch of modules and make it within a very short period of time hey you go with what works you watch the Apple cartoon (laughs) or commercial (laughs) commercial and be like that's cool you throw a bunch of stuff in I get it I get it and so it's not stitching together very well in a lot of places and see I liked it I liked the big silver Robo guy coming in and throwing uh, the lads. But can we like move move on? Yes. Yeah. Let's do what this book didn't do and move on. Go, yeah. Yes. Unexpected journeys. Go, which again, we get to chapter seven and eight, and we get into these next couple chapters, and we get these chapter titles that it's an unexpected journey. Okay, we're going. Lord somewhere. of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> like we're we're going somewhere. 
Yeah. Chapter eight, when we get to it, is Wasn't memories wait, 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 of long wait, wait, wait. ago. Great, another flashback. <laughs> An unexpected yeah. journey was The Hobbit, first of all. Yeah. Oh, that's your okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. That's uh, that, that like my catchphrase, first of all. First of all, first just of all. wait, first of all. Um, yeah, so we, uh, Lorana's being tasked to take uh, all the dragon lances to the knights at Palinthas, because Palinthas is like the, uh, the, the stronghold that uh, protects them from, you know, the mountain pass, that protects the mountain pass where the dragon army is coming through. Yeah. So get the get the lances to there. I'm I'm about I, this. I'm, can, I think this is good. Yes, yes. And can I just say that um, Theros is a stud? Yes, he is. Because <laughs> evidently he's been just kicking out dragon lances twenty four seven on an assembly that line. That robotic arm is just <laughs> hammering away. Down he's there. asleep and the arm's still making dragon <laughs> lances. <laughs> what I one thing that I feel is kind of weird is how and I get it. Uh, nobody's used a dragon lance, but they're constantly like kind of. Talking about how nobody knows what the heck to do with these things. Yeah. Like they're super big, they're really long. Nobody knows what to do with them. Like is get it, them to the knights, but we don't know what they'll do with them. Is, is well, it Lance, you yeah. stab. Is, it, is it Lorana knows how to use them? She's the one who can train people. No, I thought that by the end of this, even in the last chapters, it they don't know how to use them, and then all of a sudden, it like dawns on her, doesn't it? At the very end, and that's why he, she asked for more no, time. She, she, that, that, that's from why. Sturm? That's why she went with. Yeah, that was the only. Oh, it's because she knows. She okay, I guess with. I lost yeah. that part. Sorry, stop screaming at me, listeners. Yeah. Okay, uh, if you stop screaming at them. <laughs> that's true. I am yelling a lot in this episode. <laughs> I actually said Gorbachev in a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Who would think that one? I 100% loved that entire speech. I didn't agree with it, but I loved it. <laughs> oh, go back, listeners. Quietly think about it. It is totally Cold War oh, politics. <laughs> <laughs> See, this was written in 85, people. This was Cold War. Hey, so um, hey, hey conspiracy theory. Settle down. <laughs> That's right. And aliens did it. No, no, no. <laughs> Um, so Nash picks up his pieces of the dragon orb and Fizzman's like, hey, you can study it from the inside. That's great. Um, uh, <laughs> whatever. Okay, chapter seven. Let's go. Uh, that is chapter seven, yeah. No. Yes, no, it. chapter seven is Loriana. Yeah. Loriana. No, Nash picks up the pieces okay, of the okay. dragon orb to, orb to study oh, and Loriana's going I'm with I'm the lances. I'm chapter eight, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're getting to chapter eight. Okay, so chapter eight, scene change. The Paracon. Yeah. Tannis and crew in Flotsam, Port Town by the Blood Sea of Istar. So that's what happens. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought one of you were going to pick that one up. Okay. Uh, well, I was just making sure they were in Flotsam. Okay. Already. Yeah, they're in Flotsam yeah, and are. Flotsam and Jetsam. Uh, supposed to meet the rest of the group in Sandcrest. We have yep. already established this. Uh, uh, but Raceland says, you know, because of what he's seen in the dragon orbs, that he needs to go to Palanthus so they can he, he can learn how to use the dragon orb. Again, I get what Raceland is doing. But again, Tannis is shown as just the worst leader. You have broken up with half of your crew. You are supposed to. The world is at stake here, Tannis. You're supposed to meet up with the rest of your group, and you're just going to once again just be like, oh, so Raceland, the guy we kind of trust and kind of don't, wants to go to Palantas. Eh, let's go to Palantas. Well, that, that was talked about, though, how, like, <sighs> Raceland, or, I'm sorry, Tannis doesn't necessarily trust Raceland. So why is he trusting him and going to Palin? But Raistlin has like an opposing point of view, a a different way of thinking than Tannis does, and that's why he trusts him to talk. To, or no, I'm you know I'm thinking of it backwards. Yeah, I'm thinking of why Raistlin talks to Tannis. I mean, after so much. I, I think I think it's talking about both ways. You know, yeah, after I'm sorry, Sylvanesti, I'm I don't understand why why was Tannis because Sa- even was Tannis it? was like our relationships changed. Like, I don't, I don't know about this Raceland guy. And yet, again, he's putting everybody's lives at stake because Raceland was alone in the back with his orbs and decided that he needs to go to Palinthas. I I don't know. what Tannis, like, I should... Well, and this is even more of an occupied town than they've been in before. Like, oh, yeah. The, yeah. Like, they're... I, I have the feeling that they're walking into town for a moment here and you have the old school, like, drawn wanted poster on the wall. Yeah. And they're wandering into town. Yeah, right. I mean, this is more like, hey, Tannis, your great plan was that you all disguise yourself. You started out doing, turning tricks and doing shows in Paris. Now you're in Berlin. Way to go, Tannis. <laughs> but what do, you, great... what, what do you do when, what do you do when you go to the book burning in Berlin? <laughs> LA, Indiana Jones. You knock out a guy and take his clothes. <laughs> that's that's, that seemed that's to, exactly what happened. That seemed to fit. When did that movie come out? 85? <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, when, you have, when you're on a time crunch, you're on a time no, crunch. No, that, exactly. that, that was much, that that, was much later because that, that was Last Crusade. That was Last Crusade. Last Crusade. <laughs> they, they end up in an occupied city. Um, what, Tannis and... 
who go out? Caramon. Caramon go out. They go out, they steal some armor. Yep. Tans- Something they should have done in the last city and gotten on a boat well, or whatever. Um, well, we see how good this goes. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, Tannis kind of messes up. Um, sure. He's about to be captured. And then the big reveal. Oh, wait, no. I watched uh, Dragonlance, the movie. It's Kidiara. Uh, hey. yeah, yeah, right. Well, he's, well he's, we, he's kind of walking back and like there's an elf attacks him because he's all mad. Like, hey, you're a dragon guy and I don't like you. <laughs> and, and they're fighting and then Kidiara comes in. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's Kidiara. Well, yeah. I, did we? I, did I? Did I miss us meeting Barum on the ship? We, we Not, no. Okay. Yeah. No. Oh, you yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we, yeah. We, we skipped. We skipped all we over did. that we whole thing. That. We're skipping a lot today. Um, <laughs> yes, we are. But yeah, there's a lot going on here. But, there's but, a lot but, of but we have them. Th- they are in their little disguise, and they meet, and they end up meeting the female captain of the ship, which I kind of like. I kind of dug. I, I like this yeah. female yeah. captain. I dug her. Yeah. I like her. Maquesta, aka Mac. <laughs> yes. So, yes. so good. Ma- so good. Maquesta. And I did have this, like you know. Pirates of the Caribbean. You yeah, know, definitely. Yes, Pirates of the Caribbean female captain thing going yeah. on. Where I'm and like, we oh, we yeah. are also stereotypical. I mean, you know, now that I've been outed as this big, uh, you know, Conan fan, I was for a and, while and, and conspiracy theorist. and conspiracy <laughs> <laughs> and Cold War conspiracy theorist. Um, I, uh, don't, I don't get him started on Watchmen. <laughs> <laughs> so I I I like this part too, and I'm getting I'm getting thrown back. To uh, ideas that Conan used to be known as Amra, or, and he was, and he was like kind of a pirate on the yeah. seas as well. And I, I, I love this stuff. I, I really like it. But, not but, but I. As we go through here, we get on the ship. Max showing them around the ship. They're negotiating price, and who's sta- who's sitting there nodding ropes together? But Barum. Hey, the guy that was at the end of Dragons of Autumn Twilight. <laughs> yes. Weirdly, and we we're like, well, where's what's he gonna do? He comes into this book, still does nothing. Like, <laughs> and, 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 and to that note, Tannis doesn't recognize him. Yeah, yeah. Like, which, is, which, is, which is good. He's well, like, he looks he's a little like, haggard. Yeah, he's like what. <laughs> He's like, oh, I know that guy from somewhere. You go to, no, I don't. You go, you go to sea for a while and get baked under the sun at sea and see if people recognize you right oh. away who saw you three oh, times. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no. I'll so. be honest, I didn't remember him. For What? When they were first talking about him, all that stuff... It took me a while. The you, you know we have a podcast about these books. <laughs> I do, I do. But it was it was one of those where I saw that and I didn't even think about it. It just went right through. And then when Kitty R started talking about it, I'm like, oh, that's where it clicked. Yeah. So yeah. And he's just mending sails, but and he's a mute. Like they talk about how he doesn't talk at all. Which I'm like, well, how did he ever get the job? Uh, uh, but he's just kind of you know. If you're good with your hands, you don't need to talk. <laughs> all I'm thinking again, great. Great movie, and I'd cast Lupita Nyong'o uh, in the part of the best <laughs> yes. sort of like, that. But of course, we uh, can't leave right away. We got to wait a few days. So now we have now we have to go back into town and figure out some things going on. Right, and that's where, if I remember correctly, yeah, this is where yeah, all that, an elf an yeah, elf all attacks that Tannis, Tannis in the alley, uh, thinking he's a member of the Dragon Army, and then boom, Kidiara shows. Up. Oh, Kidiara. My love, my love, my lady, you're here. You know what? I love the art by Elmore. If there's one thing that I don't love is that hair on Kitty Ara. <laughs> and that's it's it's ruined it for me because every time I think of Kitty Ara, I should be thinking like super beautiful sexual being. All I can see is that god awful eighties feathered hair. Yeah, definitely, I, I, definitely. Yeah, so this is why I'm like Team Lorana, is because I always see Lorana as being kind of a, a sensuous elf and Kitty Ara as being one. Sigourney Weaver with a machine oh, gun. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Which, yeah, which I get, I get it. There's some people who find that. No. I don't. I never. No, I'm I sorry. I love I the either. alien stuff. I've never been though, like attracted no, to Sigourney not at Weaver. All. Yeah, not yeah. at all. Uh, but sorry, I love you, Sigourney. <laughs> but but at, at the same time, I could see you as being the Lita Ford guy and give me Joan Jett any day. Oh yeah, well yeah. Uh, yeah. Her hair was slightly okay different. for the <laughs> for you two young guys. Lita Ford and Joan Jett were two extremely hot guitar we're young, players not, from the runaway. Yeah, world. go look up album covers for Lita Ford, and you'll know what we're, we're talking. Young. We have an internet connection. Yeah. And to be fair, Lita Ford is. <laughs> and quite honestly, Joan Jett, if you are listening. <laughs> I will buy you dinner as well. Right now. <laughs> yes. I will, s- I will sit in a booth across okay, the way you, okay. and just look. Okay, you t- <laughs> would you turn down the lead of four? <laughs> okay, Kit's one bad lady. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah in yeah, a yeah. good way. In a like, good way, uh, yeah. A strong, 
female villain. I love it. We need her. We need her at this point because we have been floundering yeah. with Sturm Salomnia trials and everything else. We need Kit well, at this point. And I love Kit coming in here. I love Kit coming in here because you have Tannis who's been brooding, who's been missing her, and she, we don't know it yet, but she starts taking advantage of that right away. Yeah, right. But you have this like, oh, well, she must be doing this for some other, you know, Tannis is thinking she must be doing this for some other major plan right. that she has. And, and she thinks yeah, Tannis no. has joined the Draconian yeah. army. Yeah. Like, oh, uh, I never knew you were here. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. My ex-boyfriend oh, is now yeah. on my side. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and wait for it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have for you our official first boot scene. Yeah, yeah. Boot scene. yeah. And quite literally, I love how this scene is written. Yes, yeah. we, yes we've ragged on the, we've ragged on the love scenes. We've ragged on the the emotions and the, the sl sloppiness of some of the writing. The way this is written is phenomenal. We it talks about you know it talks about them going up to the hotel. It talks about it quite literally taking off the boots, and you quite literally with the text here with the prose, you have the close up of the boots. Yeah, yeah, yeah you really other do. Stuff happens. Yeah, I love this. Um, but this does underline for me. I like Lorana because as her as she is rising as a leader. Uh, Tannis is continuing from from the first book. I'm like Tannis. This is the guy that I should identify with because yeah. of where he's at in this. He keeps failing and failing and failing. I can get if you want to identify with this guy and try to read into why he keeps failing or he does things with his heart or whatever. But at this point, again, what an insufferable leader. I, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I really hate Tannis. I mean, here he goes. He's because of sex, he's going to just throw it all away. Again. Like, For four days. <laughs> I am not getting... Again, we've been told people follow Tannis because of his heart. Why are people following Tannis? Tannis is the worst leader I have... I'm going to put it out there. Tannis is the worst leader I've ever read on the written page. I've, I've never read a guy that's this bad. I would... Luke... I would gladly throw four days away with Kit. Because <laughs> you think she's lead of four. <laughs> no, she's Joan Jett. Oh, Joan Jett. Okay, she's Joan Jett. But Bam, did, she was lead did, of four. Did you, guys <laughs> did you guys catch the, that, that, the little snide comment as like they're going upstairs from one of the other soldiers? Oh, yeah. Yes. No, it's, yeah. yeah. The innkeeper, right? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Or it's, yeah, it's yeah. the innkeeper. As they're going up to her room, and, he, and there's a snide little comment that's something to the effect of, well... Well, that's the third guy in three days. Yeah, she <laughs> she does this she, all the time. She, like, she wears strong, them out. A strong female villain who knows what she wants. Exactly. <laughs> Nothing and, wrong and with that. And gets it. Nothing there we go. There we go. That. There we go. And that's kind of where that chap the chapter nine closes and out. Closes out. So we're going to the boot scene. The boot scene. Hi, Claris Tower and the Knighting. Sandcrest under siege. The high high Claris guards uh, the mountain. We've kind of talked about this. Sturm gets knighted. He does. Um, Derek's going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Derek's going... Again, we uh, I like this idea that you're kind of at the climax. Things are falling apart and you have internal struggle. You have this crazy internal struggle. I always run up against kind of like the reality of this. Like, okay, you're facing down death here. What are the rest of the, these knights doing? Like, are they really going to hold to this? I don't know. Would they really go with this guy? I don't know. See, I took it as the aspect of we have a group of regular foot soldiers. Right. We have a, we, we, we have a group of... of you know, regular but Salamnic knights but, involved here, but they are Salamnic knights. But they're the lower Salamnic knights, and they've been looking at their leaders, and they've been looking at the guys like Derek, going, "Oh God, yes, he outranks me, but he's kind of a jerk, and I don't really like him." And all of a sudden, Sturm appears, and it's like, "Oh God, thank God, we have somebody we can trust and follow." Right, but they don't follow him. They end up following Derek out to like fight. Yeah, against the draconian horde. But, but the younger ones are the ones I'm talking about. Right, there's, right. There's there's these younger new recruits who don't like what the knights have become. They don't like the older guys, mm -hmm. but they're still following orders. And, and, and all of a sudden, they have Sturm now as a commanding officer going, uh, and they're able to go. Holy cow! He actually knows what he's doing. Yeah, right. it's, it's all interesting. But again, I'm just gonna say pacing. Right. I, I it's supposed to be like building. To a right. climax, and it's just kind of well. And Derek's going insane, I, yeah. Which is know. which is good. I mean, all, good. I all like of this, this is good. I'll be but honest. I, w I wanted it to go faster at this point. Yeah, I was it had really. To. It I had was. To. It was. I, I was there in Mount Nevermind. I, I was. Right. I was reading and just going. 
Okay, come on, just give me a little bit. Come on. Right. No, you didn't. And then kind of a weird thing happens here. Again, if I were to write a book, I wouldn't do it this way, but I guess we're given what we're given. The dragon lances are brought to the tower, um, but nobody knows how to use them, so they just sit in a pile. Uh, there's no dragons there, I guess. So they're like, well, what do we do? Yeah, why, why, why would you? Well, why would you use them? I lo- I I really like the visuals here at the end of the chapter. We get that. Uh, I, I, I saw I, I, I saw the visuals, the movie scene of, you know, the army that's in camp waiting, and we have all the weapons, we have the dragon lances, and nobody really knows what's going on. But I thought it was a very pretty picture that was painted by Weiss and, Hi- and, and Hickman here of the snow that's falling on oh, the dragon definitely. lances. Absolutely. That was so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, the snow falling from the Habakkuk Mountains. Um, Ooh, oh, nice. An Old Testament prophet. I'm calling you out, Hickman. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> okay. We still love you. <laughs> we still love you, but I know where well. you're getting your stuff from. Um, <laughs> hey, we re- we're reading all Hey, and we when we go. jump to 11 here, because we're jumping to 11, right? Yes. Yeah, let's when do we that. jump to 11 here, by all means, give me a chapter after all of this that's just titled The Kinder's Curiosity, and I want to know what Taz is doing. The Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We, get, we, we get Derek finally snapping. And he's taking him and his merry band off to attack the Draconian army. Right. Yeah. Well, he again, Club. You just got done saying uh, something that I only half agree with is how great they are at kind of. The, you love the visuals here. This is where I'm actually rubbing up against some of the visuals because stuff looks good. But again, I'm going to constantly say Weiss and Hickman what they don't do well is kind of what I think they should be focusing on. He rides out. There's a huge battle. We see none of it. Yep. Again, we, yes, I wanted more battle. Yeah, we this constantly point. are 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 kept with our characters, and we never pull back and see this larger scope or scale of what's going on. And I think that would have been so much fun here at the beginning of chapter eleven. Mm-hmm. We got the end of chapter ten with the snow falling on the weapons. Yeah, it's peaceful and for Bob's word, juxtaposition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we open chapter eleven with just. Stuff going down, blood and guts and war and yeah, I don't understand that, that, why that opposite of that peaceful snow right. falling that we just had. I don't get why when you're writing a book again where this giant invasion is happening, why you are not building this kind of feeling of where you occasionally cut to an entire chapter, half a chapter. I would take a page and a half of of like nonstop like armies, giant armies clashing. A lot of it is left, like you said, to your mind, just your mind, like. Okay, I know it should be happening, so I'm going to like imagine it or create it out in the ether. That's okay if you're super imaginative. I see myself as super imaginative, but it's it's not great writing. That's not how you should do that. You should create big panoramic scope when you're creating this kind of work. And Bob, I will agree with you there, yeah. definitely. And I think part of this, why I was more okay with some of this stuff is I have an overactive imagination. Yeah, right, right. And I know these camp. You know, I've played some campaigns like yeah. this where it's okay. We got to sit around and wait for the battle, or the next scene is okay. You're walking. You're walking the walls of the battlements. You're right. walking the walls of the battlements, waiting for that first thing to, waiting for that first shot to be fired, essentially. Right. But the DM isn't firing the first shot yet because you got to figure out something that you're supposed to do before right. the first shot gets yeah. fired. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, you know what, you guys, I. I'm going to bring it back to when, when we were talking about, you know, the different point of views. Like, when we, we s- talked about, like, the, the White Dragon's point of view. Mm-hmm. Right. I like the tension yeah. of the being back at the High Claris Tower, that point of view. Yeah. Where all of a sudden, you see nothing. Right. And it's your Lorana. Right. Your Sturm. And there's just all this noise. Right. What is going on? I, I like right. that. Right. The pacing has been off for me in this last part of the book right. here, and I really, yeah, I, I, so I really, too. I'm, I'm just aching right. for a climax. In a, phrasing in a lot of the books that I've read that I feel that have done this well, large scale, uh, large scale battles. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, you're following far less characters. So you have the time and the breath yeah. to be able to say, I'm going to follow, like, I'm going to start out this after snow falling on lances, uh, and then after the big battle, I'm going to start with just this nameless knight that never will appear again, standing on the walls, oh, and I blah, like blah, that. and then all of a sudden an, an arrow enters his throat or whatever, and, you know, you know, you know, from the armies invading, and you take this time to spend with the invasion and horrible things happening, and then you you take the time to bring it back to your characters. None yeah. of that ever happens. We are constantly in people's minds and constantly, you know, with characters. And and I find it almost sometimes claustrophobic. I'm like, I want to push them all away and just like, give me battles and mm-hmm. scenes that are bigger and in scope 
than and, this. And Bob, in going through here and looking at you know this high Claris tower, and as soon as we get away from Flint and the Flint and Sturm thing mm-hmm. and the whole like Flint, Sturm hates Derek, Derek hates yeah, we know yeah. that. I don't <laughs> right, care right, right, right. As soon as we get into Taz wandering around the place pointing out architecture things, I'm back in. Right, yeah. right, yeah. E- everywhere in my notes, whenever there is a Taz scene, yeah. it is just. I love this, and I, I'm completely surprised by this because he's wandering around, and we're getting the and he's t- and we're we're in Taz's head, and he's like, "Well, what's this for? And what's this for? And this is kind of weird. And this doorway shouldn't, you know, hasn't been built like." I, I'm rolling. I'm rolling yeah. with it. I'm like, mm. okay, some is something going to go on here? You know what? Uh, it, it seems funny. like the, it seems like the door's open. I'm going to be Mister Naysayer here. And no kidding. I really? know. I know. Of course, I will be. And here's the thing. Again, you know the attack is coming. Yeah. To me, this is where you create. I'm a sucker for the for movies and books that that it might be cliche, but you know it's coming. So they're going to set up all kinds of traps and plans. And this is where you get mm. into their their heads as to what is the plan when they come. You know they they're going to come over this wall. We're going to do this. They get to here. We're doing this, and then you see that all unfold. Once again, our characters have no plan. And even though you like Tasselhoff just walking around. Okay. We are at the end of this freaking book. You're about to be attacked, and your main character is just walking around. That is directionless. You you don't even know the, at the very end. But that's just, a kender. Yeah, but they're just kind of stumbling upon crap once again. And I get it. Yep, yeah, that's what a kender does. But again, it it strips Lorana and all of your and 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 Sturm and people like to me. It should be they have a concrete plan. Sturm says we're doing this. Lorana says we are doing this. And all that fails, and thank God Ta- uh, uh, Taz was bumbling around and found this. That's how I'd write that. Not nobody has a plan, and thank God Taz or found but, this. But remember, we skipped over that because we, not in the podcast we skipped over it, but right. I think we all zoned out a little bit with the whole Sturm Derek conflict thing and like oh, okay this is a, this again yeah because we find out the next morning when we go when we come into this next scene here in the chapter the next morning the whole argument was about the fact that Derek wanted to start the fight yeah yeah <laughs> and you know I, I, I'm gonna say the P word again pacing Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Man, give me a climax. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. And this is the worst. This uh, is the worst battle plan, and completely shows that Derek has lost his gosh and loving. His gosh turned me into a PG show. PG show. Where's your moon? Because yes, let's take a bulk of our forces. He wanted to take everybody, and Sturm finally told him no. <laughs> right, right. But he wants to take everybody. In the, they're not coming to us. We're going to go fight them over open ground against dragons. That, Good right, idea, right, buddy. Right, right, right. Walking out of Helm's Deep. Yes, it, right. it's why exactly. Would you do that? Yeah, yeah, why would you do that? And, and again, well, we, don't, we don't see any of it. I like that he comes back and, and, and there's a, a member of the dragon army who brings them back and they're all head, they're headless. The one is headless. The one uh, is headless. Yes. And, and I, Derek, you know, and, and Lorana shoots him in the arm. I like I, I like this. I was gonna say I really liked R- Lorana shooting him. It just yeah, showed yeah. that I like she that has too. The leadership and her that was cool. S- it was a little uh, on the nose with uh, Return of the King, right. though. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Here in my notes, I say this, and I, I want to say this very with trepidation, okay? Because I mean this is in no disrespect whatsoever, okay? Um, but I feel that one of the problems going on here that I'm having is that the people who are writing this are really big into the game at the side of this and maybe aren't as great at the novel world building. Oh, I shouldn't say world building, uh, but that epic scope side of this. Because if, and maybe I'm wrong because I haven't played a lot of D&D, but when you play, my guess would be is on a table... Even if you're in the middle of an epic battle, you are your focus is still on you and your characters. Correct. You know what I'm saying? And so Weiss and Hickman are doing what's comfortable to them. And even in the mm-hmm. midst of giant epic struggle, mm-hmm. writing from the viewpoint of just the characters, they're doing what they're comfortable from a game gaming standpoint doing. But then for me, as trying to come in, can I recommend this as a wider book to a wider audience? Mm, that focus is off right here. Yeah. That focus yeah. is off. Yes, yeah. I'll agree with that. Yeah. And as we come to the end of this chapter here too, 
I like the headless coming back. I like I like that. I like, I like, I like that. Derek coming back, dying but still insane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you came back. Well, that, with, that's not going to help. Well, you came back with your headless commander. You're bleeding out, and he's still babbling about how we won the day. <laughs> <laughs> and so he dies, and. I, I just love this because everybody's looking around going, well, crap, what do we do now? And then all of a sudden, we have this, you know, I'm tugging on Bob's shirt sleeve right now. <laughs> we have the Kender running up going, hey, gu guys, 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 <laughs> there, there's, there's, there's a dragon orb in there. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I was waiting for this to turn into a, into a thing where, like, you're not supposed to go in there. Like, a big, a big, a big to do yeah. about it, but it didn't. Thank God it didn't. <laughs> well, okay, are we ready to jump into 13? Yes. Okay, yeah, so this is the pivotal chapter. Um, I, I have in my notes, I guess the tower was attacked, but we don't see it. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and again, we go back to these titles. Sunrises, darkness, darkness descends. descends. Um, so this tower's attacked, we don't see it, but... Instead, we read, again, focus off, Sturm is realizing that the measure is rigid. And then there's, I don't know, this weird line that I don't get. He's, he, he's seen through round eyes and slanted eyes and hourglass eyes. It's like he's having this last epiphany. I get the idea of the writing that you're going to give this last epiphany to your main character before you kill him. Uh, yeah, no, those kind of. I, 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 th I think I brought it up, unless that's in the part of the podcast that got deleted because we recorded on the wrong microphone. <laughs> about it being sort of the, the Michael Scott arc yeah, from yes. The Office, where yeah. oh, he's coming around. We've been focusing on him the whole time. We know he's dying. Yeah. yeah. I, you know. How did you feel at this point, Luke, though? Because you have been saying this this book doesn't have the balls to kill a character. You know, I, I have my apology written down. We'll get to there. <laughs> uh, but I, this was the. All of my notes are written in the moment. <laughs> this goes into the whole, you know. Almost Star Trek three, Star Trek four debates. You know Ooh, the the, okay. the the good of the many outweighs the need of the the good of the one, and yeah. the good of the one outweighs the need the good of the many. And where do we go? Where do we go with that aspect? And as he's talking about the eyes, mm -hmm. and this is one part where I was kind of I I, I want the battle. I know I'm towards the end of the book. Yeah. I know something's got to happen. We have fifty pages. Left. Yeah, I know something's got to happen here. But I actually liked the writing in here a lot, and I wish I knew. If I, it was, I thought you did. Yeah. I wish I knew if it was Weiss or Hickman. It's Weiss. Yeah, Is it Weiss? Sure. Yeah, it's sure. Weiss. Yep. It's Weiss. I love this aspect of him staring down at the knights, looking at you know where mm -hmm. the other knights just died, looking back at his friends and realizing, I always wanted to be this knight. I always right. wanted to be a member of this group over here. Yeah. I took for you know I never thought that my my friend group is actually better than this group I've been striving to be in for my right, entire right. life. Yeah. I agree. And I, I love like the writing that. with yes. that. Yeah, that, that, is no. good. that is good. It's a good final moment for him. Yes. And right. uh, here's where, well, I guess, well, let's get to it. Uh, Kit flies in on her dragon. Yeah, so more... Oh, oh, well, Kit. wait, wait, wait. The, the dark lady. Yeah, yeah, she flies in, and morning comes, and they, yeah, they see these dragons yeah. on the horizon, and this is but where we know it's of, her. There's no hiding. Yeah, yeah. So Lorana says uh, that we weren't gonna say anything to you guys, but we know how to use the dragon orb. You know, like she kind of left it like we weren't gonna tell you guys, uh, but we know how to use this thing. Um, lols. Yeah, yeah, lols. Um, but we need time. Like we need, we need this time. And and Sturm says that he's, you know, he knows. And I, I didn't even like take notes about this part. It was just kind of. I mean, we were finally in the climax. Like, I, I can tell, like, it started. Oh, yeah, the battle. We're, we're getting a battle. Guys, 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 guys. We're getting a battle. Yeah. And, you know, they kind of, they set up all these traps for the dragon using the High Clarist's tower. I, I will say, I liked the description of those traps. I liked I, I liked that. I'm going to have the... I want to say the P word again, pacing. You know, here's what, what it's just it was, man. If you didn't I, waste so much time in Mount Nevermind, I probably would have been yeah, into it. I, I think it was with Tass. I like how they showed us that yeah, there was something that we could that might be there. The Tass doesn't quite know, but but he has else. his glasses of plot advancement. <laughs> <laughs> I, won't, I won't lie. This is where I'm like crabby old man here, and I'm trying to rein in from where I was at. But I have a lot of WTFs written in my notes by I, this point. Um, and it, it, one of the things that kind of lynches around this is Lorana. Again, you've been sent here with all these dragon lances, and I don't know how much time has really gone on here. But she's like, oh, we're not going to say anything about it. And we well, are at war with dragons. You weren't going to say anything about how you know how to use dragon lances, and and then you know. 
Stern I, passes command to Lorana. It's like you're here with a bunch of Salamnic knights. Why are they going to listen to Lorana? Like all of a sudden, in, in the Sturm heat of said things. So. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess. I and that's part and of their she code. She knows how to use the dragon lances, and it, it was said before that she knows how to use the dragon. Right. Lances. Right. That's so why, I guess you could say they're all primed. Here. They're primed, and they know. Hey, you that guys, chick knows how to use guys, these lances. Where's Flint? I don't know. No, <laughs> yeah, just a he's, he's off in a corner somewhere taking some nitro pills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can't believe you just said that, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going, wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really? Really? Yeah. yeah, I'm like, yeah. that's hilarious. Yeah, I'm like, you know what? I don't, where that's, is Flint? That's not, that's not in anything I'm I wrote so, down. Yeah. I'm just thinking like, wait a minute. Where's you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm reeling, wow. at, I'm reeling at this point, and I'm reeling at this point because we have, we had Sturm's dead. We yeah. haven't gotten there yet. No, not yet. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We well, can, we're, we're, we're pretty, we, yeah, let's just we're go there. Right. Yeah, we're there. So in other words, Lorana needs, needs time to, to yeah. teach them how to use the dragon lances because I guess in the week she was there, she never taught them how to use it. Yeah. Um, and so... so <laughs> Planning, who does that? W- would he? Would he use it, though? The, at the time, there was no dragons. So I get this kind of plot device of that. There was no dragons and everything. I don't and, know. and he's with her. You know how to use it. It's cool. But here's the deal. You are being confronted with the dragon army. You haven't seen any dragons yet. You think it's just draconians and everything, but it feels to me like there's been time. Maybe there's been too much strife with what's going on with the knights, but you think you'd show up with the, you know, the crates of machine guns and go, hey boys, I don't know if we're going to use it in the next fight, but for the next couple days, I'm going to show you boys how to shoot these things. You know, like you'd think that time would I, be you know given what? to how to it's, use it's, it's, these. It's the thing you just said about being too busy with the other knights. And I would buy into that. There's too much going on. There's only so many hours in a day. There's no food. He's tired. He's stressed. Derek's losing his mind. And he's probably... I, I would... If I was Sturm... Man, Derek's going to kill me. Right. Like, I got I to gotta, like, keep an eye... Yeah. There's too much going on I'm going to sleep with the one eye open because right. this guy is crazy. You see? Yeah. Um, but so... It comes down to it. And Sturm knows because he is so honorable... And there's been enough character building up until this point to where I believe that Sturm is the same. I, I yes. applaud them on the character building. So good. For Sturm. It, 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 and out it, of nowhere. They deserve this moment. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. And if the writing feels really good here, I feel it's because in the annotations, Weiss says she was writing this part and that she had to stop writing because she was like crying buckets of tears at this point when, when oh. Sturm dies. So if it feels there's a lot of emotion pumped in here, there's a lot of emotion. Does I it, am such a horrible person that does it to feel me like that? reading that is like this is one of the problems. You are so invested in your characters yeah. that that they're not coming maybe across as what you think they're coming across. You have never taken a character from <laughs> level one to level fifteen. Damn you. Over <laughs> <laughs> I would hardly say that much time has been put into this. But, but, but no. Okay, fine. Level 1 to level 8. Okay. Uh, okay. That's you have I never mean. taken a character from level 1 to level 8, breathed life into that character, uh, and then all of a sudden I mean, you, know, you have to kill that character. Yeah, but the trouble is is that is that is something that's only for you. Like yeah. for, that that is something that for you has resonance and weight, but to to feel that much emotion then at this point. But I, but I, I'm gonna you know just sort of <laughs> put it all out on the table here. Hi, uh, my name's Luke. I said this bo- series didn't have the balls to kill anybody. <laughs> they killed one, and I stand corrected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And what a great. I do like for what I said. Right, I like it. I do the like writing it. of his death. Yeah, the fact that we know it's Kit. He doesn't know it's Kit. Right. Right. And we have that moment where he's standing on the wall, being the knight, being yep. the man that Sturm yep. has always yeah. talked about being. I agree. And he salutes her. Yeah. He salutes the high lady, and then we have that twinge moment because she salutes him back, yeah. and he 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 has the WTF. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean that that to me is such, that that painted such a great what our wife painted such a great picture no, I agree. with that moment of standing on the wall going, well I'm gonna die, yeah, I'll do it I'll do yeah. it right yeah. yeah no I can be the jerky heavy but I I agree I uh, I do like this can we I, I just I, I, I just like want to ask just because it, it's it's in my I took note on it um, a dragon lance ends up 
up there, and Kit gets her hands on it. Is that because yes. when he threw it a night, or is Lorana's up there? Lorana brings it up. Uh, at yeah, that point, yeah, she yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm skipping up. I'm skipping a bit here, but I don't really have much notes because it's just a lot of action. Right. And the reason I don't have notes is because I thought it was very well placed. It was very well timed. All of that went really well. You're getting sucked in. And you're I getting, am. You're getting yeah, sucked yeah, in. Yeah, you're yeah, not yeah, stopping yeah. to take notes. Exactly. Yeah, right, right, exactly. exactly. Right. But the, the only thing that I have there is Kit takes the lance and she's like, "Hey, thanks." Whoosh. And she's yeah. like about to fly off with it, and then she goes, "Nah, just J.K. LOL," and <laughs> drops it. Like, that 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 is my only. That is my last bit of commentary before the end of this book. And right, and see, I liked that. Uh, but I like that. Like, it's just kind of like it was like, what? all right, yeah, I'm. Oh, hey, oh, I don't need this to beat you. People. Okay, that, yeah, see, right. see that maybe I just didn't pick up the attitude. I, I was like, oh, was, we're gonna we're gonna take yeah. this and study this well, and totally if, kill you. If you did, she, she has a attitude. lot of attitude when she says, and by like by the way, I'm with Tannis. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, but yeah, that, and this moment when Sturm just to jump back again because I love Sturm's death scene. Mm-hmm. It is a bit cheesy because Sturm when, when Sturm actually dies and his sword flips. You you get the cheesy yeah. '80s movie of yeah. his sword. Flipping up to I the got, air. I got Braveheart. Yes. I heard bagpipes. <laughs> and <laughs> and <laughs> the sun flares off the blade as yes. it's twirling yeah. in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's melodramatic, but I'm okay with it. It's in a good way. It's, in in a good good way. Way. it's yes. good. Sturm was going to die, he was going to die like that. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I yeah. agree. Yeah. So, um, like you were saying, Luke, yes. we have this Loriana Kitiara little face off deal. I like this. Uh, just by the way, we. I really wanted to do oh, this. Is our o- opening yeah, and, singer, and, and just a, a little, but, a little nod to it, the parts that I didn't take notes on that that I am remembering now that were cool. The trapping and killing dragons. Yep. Humans yes. are killing dragons. I love yeah. that. Yeah, that, that's a big deal. Give yeah. me the underdog, baby. Give me the underdog. Yeah, I really in. like. <laughs> I like the visual here of of you know the uh, Lorana is because we kind of we skipped over it. Lorana is using the dragon orb and, and bringing these dragons in, and they're dropping the gates on them and trapping yeah, them and yeah, then yeah. stabbing them with the lances. I love this. The one part that I absolutely hate then that comes in here is Lorana's done and she's like, I can't do that again. Oh, with the dragon orb. With the dragon orb, well, like, but you do get something cool with it where she uses it. And not only does it, it draws the dragons in, yeah, but it makes all the dragon, uh, I'm sorry, the draconians, the yeah, go I'm mad. Go mad. I that, like that. Was, that. That. That, was cool. that was cool. Super cool. Again, <laughs> again, the go going with my okay. You just used this really successfully. You killed the three dragons that were attacking you, and just found out the draconians. The entire army went mad because of it. But Lorana, who I was hoping now by this point would be super Lur- tough, Lur- Lurana it's just too much that. for me. Lorana wouldn't have known. But she would afterwards. Yeah. You're like, I, I get, but like, mm-hmm. she leaves and just is kind of like, well, I'm glad it worked. I don't ever want to do that again. Like, I guess I, it was too taxing I, on her. We, we do get a little, uh, a little moment of that with Raced. Yeah. And what is going on with him when he touches it. That's true. So, so it's, we we get the it's dragon really orbs. Bad. Are, the dragon orbs are mysterious. But I feel That's that because get. they're heroes, they should be a little bit larger than life. And Lorana should be able to be like, okay, I'm willing to. That was hard. I'm willing to sacrifice my life yeah. again to save Kryn. Like I w- like I'm gonna do everything to save this dragon orb from getting destroyed because I want to use it again to defeat the army. I don't like the fact that she's just kind of like, eh, yeah. that was really hard. My brain hurt a little bit. I'm done with. Ow, that. I got well, a headache. But, you know, yeah, yeah. But, but again, we do get another timestamp, listeners, <laughs> where I'm really believing Lorana at this point. I want to convince listeners that you love this. <laughs> I know. No, I didn't say I like her. I'm still Team Kit all the oh, yeah. way. Oh yeah. But it's adding more than just the pretty princess article, mm-hmm. which which has always been my problem with her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But anyway, okay. If we if we go back to where we were, um, Sturm's dead. Right. Kit. Decided, I don't need this dragon lance. To You're gonna need the dragon lance. Yeah. Is what she says. Right, yeah. which is which I like that idea better. I just didn't pick it up in the writing. And that's that, all. And and that and that picture of her and Lorana literally standing over Sturm's body. Yeah. yeah. And Lorana confused because the dragon high lord actually reaches down and closes Sturm's eyes. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. I, I feel a lot of the visuals are really strong. Yeah. Like it's a lot of maybe poorly for me connected visuals but they're really strong when they hit they hit yeah. well yes Oof. yeah you know but maybe the connective tissue needs yeah. some work you need to suture that thing up a little uh. bit uh, but okay are we ready to move on to the funeral uh well i'm just gonna i'm gonna hit it here uh we leave this book before the prologue 
mm-hmm. with Flint, Lorana, and Tass heading to Palanthos. Mm-hmm. Tannis is a prisoner or maybe an ally to Kit. And everyone else is just hiding in Flossum. I don't know what the heck's going on. It's <laughs> yeah. very, I mean, this, yeah. book, this book does do a good job of, like, leaving mystery. Yeah. But not, I don't like the way that it's, like, I mean, I'm going to take the book at its value before the, after the prologue and before the epilogue. Right. Like, you got to, you got to, like, sum it up here for me. The epilogue should be bonus. The prologue should be bonus. But <laughs> we're just kind of like, meh. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, we, and we head to the funeral. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. I, I think the tonality of this, maybe, is, isn't on point. But, um, so the funeral, Lorana speaks at the funeral, flanked by Flint and Taz. Wait, where was Flint? Here he is. <laughs> He's here. He's at the funeral. We found him. I... I was taking a well, nap. I will say they did. I do remember them talking about Flint and the uh, dragon lances and how he was trained, but he always talked. They always oh, talked about too him short. Be, about him being too short. That's right. So he was there. It just popped into my head. But it's he just kind of it's just kind of like a, always, a dismissal. Yeah, yeah he, like, was out, <laughs> he was always just thrown in. Boy, if you'd have had more room for epic battle scenes, it would have been cool to see Flint. Fighting a little was bit, it, was holding the walls against the draconian armies. Oh wait, we got none of that. Am I, well, you am, might, I, am I losing my mind, or in, am I possibly spoiling something in the next book? Isn't Uh-oh. there some scene with where like Flint and Taz have to like duel ride a dragon to? Or, oh yeah, yeah, I am. Never yeah. mind. Yeah, yeah, never yeah. mind. Yeah. Never mind. Danger, Danger. Will Robinson. Danger. <laughs> I mean, I will definitely say you can always watch a dwarf holding the wall. You just have to go to the two towers and watch yeah. that movie. There you go. That's true. But again, I guess if I would have fixed anything. Uh, th- this last so battle maybe should have gone longer in mm. chapters and given our, our heroes more of so, fight. So we roll to our epilogue. Yes. Yeah, so Lorana is speaking an impassioned speech at this Ooh. funeral. Um, I like, actually, I like what she has to say at this funeral. I, I do too. <laughs> Claude, are you sure? Are you okay? <laughs> I, I, like I said, this book fleshed out her character more for me. I'm still not on her side. I'm still not Team Lorana. I'm, but I at least am gaining a modicum of respect for her, and not just being the pretty princess in the tower. Right. Okay. Yeah, she has grown. If there's anybody that's really had an arc, I mean, Sturm. Yeah. Obviously, he. I mean, this is the this. I feel this book has been the Sturm Lorana show. It has. Yes. Has. You yes. know, and and I'm okay with that because if you're gonna focus on somebody, I guess I, you know, yeah, try to narrow it down to a couple characters. I mean, Tannis has just been continuously dropping the ball for me. So yeah, I'm okay with these two. Race is being cons. Consistently, he's cool. cons- he's consistent. Yeah, I, um, I like him. I don't think there. I don't think there was enough race. Caramon exactly. and Tika exactly. are consistently hanging around the that, end. That is the, that trio there. Yeah, like the the true MVP of this book. Yeah, um, but yeah, Lorana had the an actual arc, a very good arc in this book. Right, Sturm did. He had a cool thing. Yeah. Gold Moon, Love Win, Love Joy. If this was a movie, like you book? would have to wait till the end book? credit scene before they'd finally pop yeah. up. Like <laughs> yeah. special thanks to Gold Moon, Love Win, Joy Love. But, some, for but being somehow in this movie. But somehow they got fourth billing in the credits. <laughs> yeah, the I don't know. They're here, I guess, yeah. breathing at some Boy. points. I don't know. Um, so we go through the epilogue, we go through this funeral, Lorana's impassioned speech. We like that. And then we jump to Sylvanesti and Alana. Kind of surprising. Yes. Again, I, I know we kind of, some of us kind of like the Alana thing. This feels like so tacked on. I Again, at the end of this book, we're going to spend time with Alana, who I don't feel deserves any of this. Like, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know why we're here Al-Han- talking to her. Al- Alhana was kind of my, uh, my dark haired... Uh, anti-hero in this book. I don't know. You kind of so liked her? I like dark-haired You like that opening girls. scene in Tarsus. That's why you like that. Hey. <laughs> I actually I actually Hold had down. to go back and remu- review my notes to go, who are we talking about? <laughs> Ohana. Well, again, because they, they do this whole thing where they give this star. Like, this is supposed to be a big thing. But again, if this book gets one thing wrong for me, it's because characters just meet and fall in love. Like, she just... She met Stern, fell in love, gave him like kind of the biggest deal ever, and Elf is gonna give her this, give a human this star. Mm. Big deal. Who cares? We're never gonna talk to her. She just kind of bumbles in and out, and then we're gonna give her a big moment at the end that she doesn't deserve. People just meet up and, and just like Silvara and Gothanis, they just I'm meet, not, fall in love, who cares? Whatever. Hers was 
This one made way more sense than Gilthanas and Silvara. Tell me how they fell in love. Why it, it did they was, fall it was, in love? It was uh, the I mean, heat of battle. Like, did they know. have a dinner? That's just no. sexual tension. Okay, That's what, <laughs> whatever, man. They fell in lust. And you know what? I would have too in that moment. <laughs> this is why you should... Never mind. And you know, and it, it was just kind of like... It was just like this... Sh- like a, a hot, bright, quick fire. Like woof! Like it was there, like a high school romance. And then, and then she remembered. And then <laughs> she remembered. College. <laughs> I don't think maybe it might. It might have carried into college After a little bit. After beverages. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but it. I see it. It was there. It was quick. But I think it, oh, it, I it was. It, it was so special because. How was she, it special? She's Sylvanesti, and he's a human. Yeah, and but the fact that she even felt that. Was like that's crazy. That's but based not a on thing. what? Because he had long mustaches. Like why? Why didn't she the fall heat, for the him? The heat of battle, Bob. The heat of battle. God. I'm gonna start looking. Like okay, and, he, okay. Well, hey, act- single people out there, find yourself a battle going on. Grab yourself some I've women. I've been trying. <laughs> yes. So fine. You don't agree with the love story. No, I don't. You're yeah, in the love we're story. We're yelling at each other. We go through. We go. Th- we go through this. Uh, her walking along the walls, and the jewel starts glowing, and. She brings it off to her father's grave and starts to bury it, but then the jewel starts glowing again. And I'm having this mind picture of, is there some way that Sturm's coming back? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, as, yeah. As, as a zombie elf. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was Luke's really ghost worried. comes back. Like, yeah, they, they don't have the balls to and kill then, anybody. <laughs> and had they, sto- had, had they stopped there, had they stopped at just that picture of her in the grave holding the jewel that's all of a sudden glowing again for some reason, yeah. cool. It would have been like the end of Carrie. The hand would have come up. So <laughs> I actually... I, no, I, no, dude. I, I just, just, just her like, holding that. I probably not, would have thrown the book. Not, not, not... The, this whole thing where, like, she put... Where, like, she presses it back down on the ground and all of a sudden the tree stops bleeding next to her. Okay. I was like, okay. what What the hell? No. I don't want that. Just just her holding it, looking at it, because I, I seriously thought, like, did she trap his soul in there somehow? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. Is there okay, some I'm sorry. sorry. Did, I'm sorry. That was... The, the, the end of the book is kind of a blur for me. Yes. She set it down and the tree stopped bleeding? Yes. That's cool. Yeah. No, it's... Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. But that had nothing to do with Sturm. No, I know. Maybe it's his spirit. The trouble is, again, I'm going to go back to there's cool visuals in yeah, this. Things yeah. that, uh, if you're imagining it, are like, that would make an awesome movie. But if you really just pull back and go, like, how does this all connect together? It is just vignettes of crap or if all she stitched even, together. Or if she even left it there. Or if she even <laughs> left it there. And let, like, all of a sudden, because of Sturm being such an honorable and good soul, he's helping the forest heal now in his in, in his death because okay, of the connection yeah, on the... Yeah. But no, she just looks at it, it glows, the tree stopped bleeding. Instead of burying it with her father, which was the entire reason she came out here, she just puts it on and walks back to walks back to the castle. <laughs> okay, well, right. we, we, can keep, we can keep arguing over the symbolism, the symbolism of, of this... Um, Star, yeah, right. Or we can just finally wrap up Volume oh, Two, <laughs> Dragons of Winter Night. Ugh. If what you a- are still here with us, we folks, love we you. love you. We love you guys. Yeah. Thank we you so you very yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. It has been so much fun um, for us to be able to do this, and for us to, you know, it's a sign of everything that we keep getting this impassioned about this. <laughs> this yeah, is true. This I, don't, I don't think, Bob, I don't think I've ever, like, raised my voice at you. <laughs> 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 That's never happened. <laughs> anyway. That's great. Let's, uh, let's wrap this up, up with our final thoughts and get out of here so we can make it to work on time tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Finally, we get to the review section. Paul, what'd you think of Dragons of Winter Night? Well... I'll start off with what I'm giving it. I'm going to give it a 4.5 glimmers out of 5. I loved it. I didn't like some parts of it. There's always that little bit. I know I'm getting some looks as I say this, but I'm reading this as a kid. I love the comedy. I love how it goes different places. Kids are all over the place. Soak in their books. All right, I loved that it went everywhere. Would I recommend this to a 27-year-old? No. Would I recommend this to a kid? Sure. Go ahead, read it. If you're getting lost, okay, it happens. Something else will pull you back in. All right, there's always that one thing that can bring you right back into a story, and this book has a lot of it in my mind. 
That's what I'm going with. Club, what are you going with? Paul, I'm kind of with you on this. I like how some of the characters that I maybe necessarily wasn't comfortable with or I didn't really like their archetypes in the first book, I like how they got fleshed out. I like I, I understand Lorana more. She's st- she's no longer the pretty princess in the high tower for me, which was what always bugged me about her and why I always wanted to be on I always wanted to be on Tannis's side. I hate the fact how Tannis was portrayed in this book. I don't want to be there. I don't want I wanted him to I wanted him to be I wanted him to be the good guy, the leader, the one who's going to take this entire group through. And I really felt that that died in this book. I love the fact that Kit's in. I love the fact that we get Kit in. I am Team Kitiara all the freaking way. I don't care if she's a. I don't care if she's evil. I don't care if she's on the wrong side. I will suit up and follow the Dragon High Lord Dark Lady. That being said, I'm kind of on the same page with you. Had I not read the first, you know, of course, had you not read the first book, the second book's not going to make any sense. Had I not um, looked at some of, you know, the additional information, had I not, looking at it now, this book actually gets a much higher rating for me than it would have before I read Dragons of Dwarven Depths, which is that middle, that middle book between one and two that was written 30 years later. After reading that, after reading this book, it hugely upped my rating of this book. I am going to sit at a 3.5 out of 5 broken dragon lances because there's things in this book that are broken, but it's still a, it, I can see how it can still be a weapon of grand design. Luke, how are you feeling, my young friend? This book was definitely. As much as I hate this metaphor, it was a roller coaster for me. Just ups and downs. It started on a huge down. And then it just went up. I, it was... There are bad parts. There's no question about that. But for all the bad, there's so much good. Like, I, I'm having so much fun. All these characters are really starting to grow on me. And I and I, I think I've said, I said this in our last podcast. It's kind of like Stockholm Syndrome. Like, I'm just stuck here with them, and I'm starting to like them. Um, and I, I say that, but Lorana, I, I, will, I will keep hammering that point home. The best arc in this book. There are pacing problems. And I, I really, I have a hard time getting over that. But I'm, I'm going to, I probably would have had less pacing problems if I wasn't reading this for a podcast and not rushing through it. If I, if I would have been reading it more casually... Maybe they wouldn't have been there. Maybe I would have enjoyed Mount Nevermind. And honestly, this book kind of redeemed the first book for me, though. It was... I don't, I don't, I don't know what's... There was, there was action. The, the, there was lore. This world grew. And these characters grew. I'm feeling a sense of danger from the world and what is going on. And right now, actually, I wouldn't just recommend this to somebody younger than me. This series. I'm sorry, I should re- put this in a bubble, this series. I recommend this to somebody my age. This is fun. If you're into fantasy, this is fun. I'm really looking forward to what's going on in book three, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with this series, because I am a stickler for an ending. If you ruin an ending, it will ruin a series for me. But where I'm sitting right now, I will give this book three and a half Shiraks (laughs) out of five. (laughs) But Bob... I think we all really want to know, what did you think about Dragons of Winter Night? Uh, yeah. So, uh, Dragons of Winter Night. Uh, I wrestle with this. Can I recommend a book halfway through that I haven't recommended any of the first? I haven't recommended Autumn Twilight. I haven't recommended the first part of this book. I look at it something like this. Um, I feel like it, it goes back to an illustration of teaching my daughter how to ride a bike. The training wheels are on, okay, and she's kind of staying upright, and then eventually comes a time where you take the training wheels off, and and things get a little wobbly. Um, I feel like with Autumn Twilight, those, the training wheels were on with with the uh, the modules. You had teams of people kind of keeping things straight lined. 
Um, and I feel even though I didn't recommend those, the highs weren't all that high, but the lows weren't all that low. And they just kind of turned into oatmeal for me and I just kind of a mild not recommend. Um, with this, I feel like now the training wheels are off. The modules now are gone. Weiss and Hickman are on their own and things are wobbling all over the place. I have extremely high highs, higher than Autumn Twilight. I have extremely low lows, uh, you know, where I'm worried that the bike is going to fall over uh, on this series. Um, and so I'm really wrestling when I look through my notes as to do I recommend this or not? Just so listeners know... I always take this from a standpoint of if I pulled this off the shelf in a bookstore and somebody asked me, one of my friends came up to me who is into fantasy but isn't necessarily into anything else, Dungeons and Dragons or anything else, would I recommend it and say, hey, go for this series. You're going to love it. Hey, you've you've read Lord of the Rings. You've read Game of Thrones. You've read uh, Prince of Thorns. Read this next. This will really hook you. Um, it's hard because not recommending Part one, how can you possibly jump into the middle of part two and recommend it? I'm left with the fact that there are some, some things that I really love. For all that I've railed against, even the stuff with them in their little traveling magic act, I liked that stuff. I just didn't understand why they were doing that. You know, a lot of this is like kind of real world things of like, this is bad. This is bad why they're doing what they're doing. Some of this is just done because it looked cool in a movie. Some of this maybe is blatantly ripped off from other things. Whatever. In the end, the fact that they had the cojones to kill Sturm and that that all felt so good that the end kind of... Well, is this Empire Strikes Back? This is not Empire Strikes Back, okay? Um, I'm, I am not on that boat whatsoever. Um, but if I take this series as a bubble, yeah, it's darker, it's grittier. I love what happens with Lorana. I love what happens with Sturm. Um, I am going to eke out the mildest 2.75 shattered dragon orbs. Mild, mild recommend on Dragons of Winter Night. So I never thought it would happen, but we have gone around the table for recommends. Whoa, well, on that bombshell, Bob, we're going to have to uh, exit out of here quickly because we have spent far too much time talking about this book. Yeah, go ahead and get out of here no. before I actually oh. don't recommend the book. Exactly. I'm, now I'm thinking about what I Be just quiet. said. Be quiet. Be <laughs> quiet. Uh, um, yeah, thank, thank you, everybody, for listening to this. Um, guys, I will, I'll leave the tip. Um, Spring dawning in, two, in, in, in like a month. In a month? A uh, couple weeks or something. Couple weeks. Couple weeks. Couple weeks. I don't know. Hey, bartender, keep this. Let's get the heck out of here. Hey, hey honey, you're good. Yeah. Okay, let's get out of here. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dungeons & Dweebs. There's even more adventuring to be had at our website, DungeonsAndDweebs.com. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at DungeonsAndDweebsPodcast at gmail.com. You can also find Dungeons & Dweebs on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Find all those links at DungeonsAndDweebs.com. If you enjoyed the podcast, please help spread the word by giving us a five-star review on iTunes. The music for Dungeons & Dweebs is Fatal Fight by Royalty Free Kings and can be found at their website, royaltyfreekings.com. Dungeons & Dweebs is a Tim Gilbert Media Production, copyright 2017, all rights reserved, and no part of the show can be reproduced, repurposed, or redistributed without the written permission of Tim Gilbert Media. <laughs>